I'm just going to wait till I see it on screen. So He's going to wait. Minute. Just Carl's going think... always... to... Do we like when you're, when you're streaming? Mm-hmm. You've yeah. got to wait until you see like one person comment in chat so you know you're live. <laughs> yeah, you just got to get that weird moment of just like, did everything work? Are we Are we good? Are we good? Are we live? And you're just, you know, it's only okay. our generation does that. Is this like yeah. the extended millennial pause? Yeah, yeah. Have you heard about this? Like the millennial pause? Do you want to explain that for folks at home? Yeah, that's just like that whole thing of, oh, well, millennials, because they're not used to things working instantly because that's not mm-hmm. how we worked when we were younger. There was always a delay. Like you see when, you know, for example, someone's recording like a TikTok. If they're a millennial, generally they press the thing, wait for a second to make sure they see that it's recording and yep. then begin. And it's one of those things where it's so prevalent and so consistently observable in people around our age, it has a name, the millennial pause. Mm -hmm. And that is just because when we grew up, things didn't work at the moment we pressed record. Remember that you'd hit record and you'd talk and it cut off like the first second. Yeah, exactly, yeah. But we're not here to keep pausing, Carl. Hopefully we can continue nice and fresh. But welcome to the Wiki Weekends podcast. I'm your host for this week's episode, Lucas Holland, and it always... And as always, it brings me a great pleasure to introduce my lovely co-host for the week, Carl Smallwood. Yeah, we get to talk about gorillas today, I'm excited. Well, I don't get to talk about gorillas much. You're going to talk with me about gorillas. We are, we are, that's true. But for anyone new here, Carl and I are both going to bring a wiki page of our choosing to hopefully find a fun discussion to come from. And that is your job as your... Then it is your job as listeners, I'm apparently a bit rusty today. But it is your job to choose which wiki won this week, which you can officially vote for by joining our community Discord, the link to which you can find below. Oh, I can put it on screen right now. Look at that. For people watching live at home, I can just put a link right in there. So the conversation can happen simultaneously in two planes of distance. Hell, goddamn, yeah. And Carl, do you it. want to know which wiki won last week? I would like to know which wiki won last week. So it was a competition between the two X-Men themed uh, wikis we brought, myself bringing Rogue and you bringing Jean Grey. Which of those did our audience prefer? It seems as though you must have like touched me mid podcast because it started out going towards me, and then you stole my power and you won that week. Just you broke, can't not just... vote for the Southern Bell. It's true. You can't not vote for the Southern Bell. It's true, and it's one of those things of like Jean Grey is just a godlike, powerful, which makes for some fun conversation. But everyone just is charmed by good old Rogue. Yeah, you can't not be, and if you're not. And you give her a kiss, give her a all smooch, you're dead. <laughs> now what? But yes, that's the, that is the thing we do, isn't it? The Which Wiki won this week? So if you are listening along with this live or after the fact, and it's within a week of it being released, you can click on the Discord link below and go vote for which of the wikis we're about to discuss you prefer. And it's not necessarily which is your favourite, it's which you think brought the best discussion for that week. Exactly, yes. And we are currently streaming this episode live, so if you're here in the live chat, hello. And please, if you could, you know, if you think we've earned it, just give us a little like to help more people find it while we are currently live. Um, yeah, that course, is a thing. Weird, yeah. That is, a, that is a weird thing about doing it live, yeah, that we have to get used to. And, of course, you know, if you want to leave any super chats made during the show, like anything um, that you want to comment, Carl and I will be sure to read them out before the end of the podcast. And yes. then if you are watching or listening later, just a reminder to give us, like, the good like comments, subscribe, like I reviews, hate all this, don't all you? that jazz. Yeah, I just we don't like it, but it needs to be said and done. Yes, and if anyone's wondered why, do you, if you hate it so much, why do you do it? There is multiple like like studies being done that just asking people to do it means it's more likely to happen. Same thing like putting a face in the thumbnail. Mm-hmm. If you put a face in the thumbnail, even if we don't really want to ask the moment we mention it, more people are likely to do it just because they're kind of reminded that that's an option for them. Yeah. Um, but it would be great if anyone could, you know, help just in any of those ways and or just, you know, share the podcast in general to a friend or two. Just spread the good word. Just play it on a jukebox next time in a bar. <laughs> and also remember, yeah, you can find us on most podcast services just by searching for the Wiki Week Days podcast. Um, and yeah, feel free to give us a review. And I believe as well, I heard someone else say on a podcast I was listening to that Google Podcasts, okay. Google Podcasts, surprise, surprise, is apparently going away. Isn't it oh. weird that Google are dropping a service, Carl? How odd of them. They, I, 
What is it with that company and just shooting their own products in the back of that? I do not know, but if you're unaware, according to someone else I was listening to, Google Podcasts is going away, so maybe go find us and follow us on a different service if you use Google Podcasts. Yeah, if you listen to it on Google Podcasts, like, good luck. Yeah, like, surprise, surprise, who would have thought Google right. got rid of their own technology and service? Pro tip, Spotify's free. The version on Spotify's free and it comes without ads, so... True, true, true. It's not a plug, it's just, it's a good way to listen to podcasts. Yes. Um, and then, yeah, you can find Carl and I in other places on the interwebs, but we will talk more about that later. Yes. Carl, what have you brought for our Godzilla vs. Kong special? Well, I, you asked me to do, uh, find a wiki entry on something related to King Kong, yes? Uh, Godzilla, right? What? No, I'm joking with you, King Kong, okay. yeah. <laughs> I was just confused. Oh, I can go. I've got two just in case. But uh, yeah, so we're not talking specifically about the movie Godzilla vs. Kong, although we're using that. Oh, it's not even Godzilla vs. Kong. They verse. Now they're teaming up for New World Order to but fight it, the weird lanky chimp. They're fighting Lanky Kong now. Isn't it, isn't it like Fallen Empire or something? New World something. Order is like NWO, like the, the wrestling. <laughs> I, the thing is, there's a poster for it like outside my building, and every time I walk past it, I'm like, I'm going to watch that with my dad. I love the idea of like N like WCW versus NWO, but the NWO is just Godzilla and Kong. I think it might be Fallen Empire. You're right. Mm -hmm. I, I just know it it's. Got, I just know it's got Godzilla and Kong, and Kong's got a fucking power glove now. Yeah, and that's you the thing that? is like I hadn't watched Godzilla versus Kong, and I'm just like trying to make the thumbnail for this. I'm like, why is he got like a bionic arm? What is going on? Well, he's got like it's a. I think it's a reference that I made, and someone at least one person gonna lose their shit over this reference because it's a game no one knows. And it's Wild Nine. I think I mentioned it like a week or so ago. It's a game called Wild Nine for the PlayStation One, and that has the gimmick where he has like a power gauntlet that grabs things and you slam enemies around. Oh, uh, King okay. Kong has that. I was more thinking like Bionic Commando kind of arm, but yeah. No, because that uh, reaches out physically. It uses, this uses like energy. And you've just got, oh. like, King Kong throwing skyscrapers at people. Because that would be great, though, if it was, like, the mechanical grappling hook arm that they had in Biocomando. That King Kong would be so scary. Just He's just rolling around like the Rad Spencer arm. Yes, I scoured, like, you know, a few wikis, and I thought the one that would be fun to talk about would be the King Kong 2005 film. So the wiki entry on that. Because that was, oh. I think, a worthy successor to the original one from like the 1940s, I think it was, 30s. Right. Or yeah. the 1930s, yes. Because that was the one where it's like the black and white one where they fought like dinosaurs and it was yeah. all like the kind of claymation esque kind of thing, like the stop motion stuff. Yeah, and it's like, I think it's like, a, it might have been like early Ray Harryhausen or something like that. Because like, I've seen it, but it was like years and years ago. But I think, yeah. I remember watching like the King Kong 2005 one, like, man, this is a really good film. It's just a. A really good film about a giant gorilla fighting T-Rexes. And some of it visually holds up quite well still. Oh yeah, absolutely. The um, King Kong like himself mm -hmm. really holds up. Like The bit where he's on the ice and you know, like the gorilla slide tech and he's spinning around. The, the bit where they're there. fighting bugs, that does not hold up well. I thought the bit where it was kind of close up with the bugs looked okay. The bit where like they're running away from the big stampede looks bad. Like Yeah, and I will say, if anyone wants a laugh, go watch the scene from King Kong 2005 hmm. where the bugs eat everybody and then close your eyes when Jack Black's film gets eaten and it sounds like Poe. Because Jack Black, if you remember, he gets like, he's, cause he's like the guy who's filming stuff and his film gets eaten by the bugs and he goes mad and he picks up a stick and starts beating up all the bugs. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, the noises that he makes, it's just Poe. He's just doing <laughs> Poe sound effects from like Kung Fu Panda. And it's, if you close your eyes, it sounds like Poe. Because mm -hmm. oh. he just loses his shit and just like fist fights all the insects, doesn't he? Yeah, I mean, like, I've not watched that film since it probably came to cinemas, but I am excited to talk about it and just, you know, Carl, give us those intros. Let us some, know so, some details about the movie. So King Kong is a 2005 epic adventure monster film co-written, produced, and directed by Peter Jackson. So this is before the Lord of the Rings franchise. Wait, no, it's not. Oh, sorry. Uh, this was half the heels of it, right? It was... Uh, oh, it was made at the same time. I know oh. this is like... I remember him doing this around, like, earlier, and then he did, like, his monster movies before that. Because mm. no one like... ever... Watched, everyone always talks about, like, 
Peter Jackson's like the Lord of the Rings guy, go watch his fucking horror movies. To be fair, though, there's a good reason why people make sure they talk about like the Lord of the Rings trilogy when they mention Peter they do. Jackson. Well, go watch his. Uh, I forget the name. Like, I'm gonna have to double check. Like, what was like the movie made where it got banned for like 50 years? It's like the bloodiest movie ever made. Oh my god! I didn't. Yeah, yeah that, I don't really associate Brain Peter dead. Jackson. What was that? Sorry. I think it's Brain Dead. I was gonna yeah, say so... like I don't associate him with like bloody horror movies or anything. That's how we got his like um, uh, first foray into film, and it's there is it's Brain Dead, which mm. is one of the single bloodiest movies ever made. They used more fake blood on the uh, set of that movie than almost any other movie ever made. There's like a bit where they're just like throwing buckets of fake blood on the actors. Oh, fair. And, and they're he... just—I think that's the one as well where someone just has a lawnmower and runs through a big crowd of zombies with a lawnmower upturned. <laughs> like they wish they ripped off for Dead Rising. I think that's the movie where that happens. And you right. watch like this guy directs Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Yeah, that that's such an odd turn, and I I always find it funny when you find ones like that of just like, oh, when it's like, oh, who directed like Fast and Furious two, and it's like James Wan or whatever. It's like there's so many weird movies that it's like, hey, do you know where Michael Bay cut his teeth? Do you know yeah. what he was famous for before he started directing action movies? The Got Milk commercial. Oh, do that famous right. like ad campaign like the got milk it's celebrities drinking milk mm. michael bay directed those and if you go look it's like the milk explodes it makes sense <laughs> <laughs> even milk is not safe from explosions yeah but i just love that about peter jackson Everyone always thinks oh lord of the rings maybe king kong it's like no go watch his splatter movies where he just didn't give a fuck it's like james gunn isn't it you go watch like his early shit oh, like yeah. slither and stuff mm -hmm. i really and that thing is that's how we got like really kinetic style that made him so famous, like working with all these, like you know, these low budget horrors. Can you imagine just being on that set where you're just pouring just gallons of blood on people? And like, don't worry, in a couple of years you're going to be telling people that like music came from the moon as you shoot Helm's Deep battles. Yeah, don't worry. In a couple of years you're going to be bragging about working with a guy who won like eleven Oscars or some shit. But yes, this is the eighth entry in the King Kong franchise and the second remake of the 1933 film of the same title, following the 1976 version. And I think the 1976 version, I always get confused between that and the original. Because the mm. 1976 version is the version where instead of climbing the Empire State Building, King Kong climbs the Twin Towers. Oh, right, okay. Because the Twin Towers, I think, are just are not recent, but I think they've been built around that time. Mm -hmm. And you have the visual of King Kong jumping between the Twin Towers as planes fly towards it, which is right, yeah. a really weird visual to watch now. Obviously now with today's context in mind. With the height, yeah. Odd. A bit odd to go back and watch, but yeah, that's interesting that they would change it from like the Empire State Building because even when I was younger, I guess like, I always associated the Empire State as being the iconic building in New York. Yep. It's the one that King Kong climbs, isn't it? And he like, sat on there like swiping at um, the planes going past. Mm -hmm. And the film stars Andy Serkis, Naomi Watts, Jack Black, and Adrian Brody. And I like that Andy Serkis gets top billing. And do you know why, Lucas? Do you want to guess? Well, he's King Kong. He's King Kong. Yeah. He's King Kong. Of course King Kong gets top billing in King Kong. Yeah, who else is star of King Kong? Do you know one of the things I adore about those Monsterverse movies? They always bill King Kong and Godzilla as themselves. Yeah, like, that's that's one thing that I adore about Godzilla is that Godzilla is treated as a celebrity, a, like, yeah. a celebrity and an actual entity and unfortunately a cop. Yeah, he did get he did get his like honor. Oh, right, <laughs> like, oh no, Godzilla! No, why would you betray us? Oh, we can talk about it when you like, get to the uh, the Godzilla conversation. Ooh, but, yeah, Godzilla sure is a cop. <laughs> or Godzilla being a cop. Yeah, but I I adore they build them as real people. Like when you're watching like King of the Monsters, and you get to the tra like the end bit in the credits, like oh, and featuring King Kong as himself, Mothra as themselves. It's like yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. And it's like the idea of like just getting in like a four hundred foot tall gorilla in the makeup <laughs> chair. Oh man, I mean, like, because this one was again around the same time as Lord of the Rings and Andy Circus being Gollum and King Kong for all like the capture and stuff. Like, it's, it's what put him on the map, yeah. Mm -hmm. And to this day, like, you know, he's spent a career being continually just more and more ape because he was. The main ape in the Planet of the Apes and the War of the Planet Caesar, of the Apes and all yep. that, yeah. He's Caesar. Like, the man knows how to be a like, he knows how to like be an ape. He really does. He's very good like, at it. One day, I hope we're going to get that joke musical from The Simpsons, you know, the Planet of the Apes musical, 
Or the oh, ape yeah. just starts breakdancing. <laughs> he mentions here that um, as the first... Ooh. Uh, b- 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 so the plot of the story, just a giant like legendary gorilla known as Kong, who they ca- who's captured and taken to New York City. Development began in 1995. Ooh. So 10 years prior, when Universal Pictures approached Jackson to direct the remake of the original film. The project stalled in early 1997 as several ape and giant monster-related films were already under production, and Jackson had planned to direct the Lord of the Rings film series. Mm-hmm. As the first two films in the Rings trilogy became... This is why I thought it was around the same time. As the first two films in the Rings trilogy became commercially successful, Universal went back to Jackson hat in hand <laughs> and expressed interest in research. Because like, that way you can just put from the guy who directed Lord of the Rings. Like, and just slapping that shit on a trailer, done. When those first two movies came out, like, can you imagine how in demand and available like peter jackson was just fucking dump trucks of money must have been rolling up at that dude's house yeah and like you know only topped of when they try to make the hobbit trilogy yeah it is currently one of the most expensive films ever produced as its budget climbed from initial 150 million dollars to a then record-breaking 207 and i can see your face if you're like that's a lot of money but that doesn't sound record-breaking isn't it quaint that 20 years ago $200 $200 million was a lot for a movie. I mean, though, like, some of, like, the Avengers movies were, like, that kind of budget. I think I always Avengers, think... Infinity War, and Endgame were estimated at 500 mil between two movies. Then you got marketing on top of that. Well, yeah, of course, yeah, and that had, like, God-level amount of marketing, but the idea that, yeah, it was cracking over 200 mil 20-odd years ago. It's crazy. Yeah. I think the one that always gets me is there's a Pirates of the Caribbean movie that cost four hundred million dollars to make. Oh, All in. and it was like one of like the, it was the bad or one, the yeah. fifth one or something. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't even one of the good ones. I think it's when they realized they one of them went super stratospheric. I think the Davy Jones one was like ridiculous. It made like a billion dollars or something. I think the, so third the next one, one they went all in. Insane amount, and they were just like, well, the money will just keep going up, right? Well, the money always goes up. <laughs> so. King Kong premiered. In which city do you think this movie premiered, Lucas? I mean, it's got to be New York, right? New York City, of course it did. On December 5th, 2005, was theatrically released in Germany, United States, like a week or so later. It garnered many positive reviews and eventually appeared in several top 10 lists for 2005. And yeah, I, I, I will agree with that. I watched it in the cinema with my dad years ago, which is why I'm taking him to go see. Like, you know, um, uh, the mm-hmm. new Empire one with Godzilla and Kong, because just a formative memory of mine is watching this movie with my dad. And I was like, I mean, what, 2005, been like 11? Uh, literally, like, same thing for me. My dad taught me to go see this in cinemas at the time, yeah. And it mentions here that it was commercial success, grossing um, uh, over half a billion dollars, and became the fourth highest grossing film in Universal Pictures history. It also generated several hundred million dollars in DVD sales, and was largely received positively, though there were some criticisms over its three-hour runtime. It's like, there is no amount of runtime I won't accept for a movie starring a giant gorilla. <laughs> My only complaint is that the gorilla's not on screen more, and I get it. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you want the appearance of Kong to be something well, you build up to. It is one of those things, right, of, like, Jurassic Park, for example. Like, you don't want to spend three hours with the dinosaur. I do a bit. I mean, a part of me does, but that wouldn't make the best movie, I guess. Yeah. Although I, I will give like the later movies, like you know, the later movies in the, the Kong franchise uh, credit because they really listen. Like Kong Skull Island, listen to that criticism of like the 2014 Godzilla movie. Of where the fuck is Godzilla? Oh, I mean, there's not much King Kong in the 2005. That 2014 Godzilla. There's no Godzilla. Really. There's no Godzilla. It's One like, of the primary antagonists of the film uh, gets killed on a screen in the corner in the background of a shot. It, it, obviously, Godzilla does turn up in the movie. We're being hyperbolic, but for the amount you want to see Godzilla in a co- movie called Godzilla, Godzilla. Very little. I think someone worked it out. He has like 11 minutes of screen time. In like a two-hour-plus movie. Yeah. And then in like the Kong movie, Kong Skull Island, within five minutes, you've got King Kong. Where it's like, yes! Yeah, let's go! <laughs> Like what? Do you have a favorite like King Kong moment? So I think for me, like that Kong Skull Island movie, I just love that Kong just don't give a fuck. Mm-hmm. I love how just like like you know large in charge and relaxed that gorilla is. Yeah, and um, one of the things that I've had to get clips of multiple times 
just because how badass it is, is the uh, the Kong Skull Island fight where with the, the, the skull crawlers, the skull crawlers, yeah, and just just coming in with that, as we always say, that Donkey Kong like forward aerial. He really, it really Ooh. is a Donkey Kong forward air, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's almost like perfect shots. You see a skull crawler coming in, and then you like see over it's like skull crawler shoulder. You just see Kong. Like, oh! <laughs> with a giant rock it's like yes gorilla use tool Man, yeah that that fight is incredible and i've not particularly been like keeping up with many monsterverse movies or anything i like. watch them all i love them all I, I the last thing is i enjoy them i don't really like know why i haven't watched them but i just i guess i haven't got around to it at some point but it's one of those things of every time i would just watch like king kong fighting away it's like oh man that was so good it's more as well i like, just the difference between, like, you know, because they're Godzilla and Kong now, eternally entwined. Mm hmm. Just, I love that King Kong fights, you know, using his mind. He doesn't have the raw physicality that, you know, the old, uh, the big G has. Mm -hmm. So he fights with, like, weaponry, like, in the bit where, like, I think he's fighting a pissed off Godzilla. <laughs> and Godzilla's just like atomic fire breath in an entire city and King Kong, oh, he's just jumping from skyscraper to skyscraper. What are you meant to do? You're just a big monkey. <laughs> He's just doing the platforming section. Like, ah! <laughs> That's the quick time event to avoid the lasers. Oh, dear God. With the development of the movie, Peter Jackson was nine years old when he first saw the 1933 film and was in tears in front of the TV when Kong was shot and fell off the Empire State Building. Oh, no. I was wondering then where that sentence was going when you're like, Peter Jackson was nine years old when production started of this film. It's like, oh my god, he was on it. We we does say here he attempted to recreate the film using his parents' Super 8 film camera and a model of Kong made of wire and rubber with that his mother's excellent. fur coat as the hair. <laughs> god, See, cool. I wanted to release I wanted to release that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to put that movie in the cinema to put from the guy who directed Lord of the Rings. Oh... <laughs> uh... And that's it. It's a really sad moment, and I'm, mm -hmm. you know, the poignancy of Kong dying. I get it, but I think if I could go back in time and I could put a word in the ear of like those guys in 1933, I'd say a sequel. And I know they did make a sequel where <laughs> he just comes back. They made Son of Kong. So I think they go back to the island and find another gorilla. Right. I'd have told them cinematic universe, mate. Yeah. Bring them all in. And that's the thing, like, you mentioned that Godzilla and King Kong are, like, intertwined now. When was yes. the first time that they interacted? It wasn't just, like, the recent films, was it? No, no, it was years ago. It's, uh, I want to say it's, like, the 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know the exact what it was, Godzilla versus Kong. Right, yeah. And it was just, like, Toho just got permission to put Kong in the movie, and they team up. Just when Toho just didn't give a crap, and they were like, they didn't give let's make now. Godzilla like fight everything. Like he turns up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And like there's some movies as well where um, they bill the guy, Jet Jaguar, who's like appears in some of the Toho movies. Mm -hmm. um, because Jet Jaguar is not popular outside of Japan. Sometimes they just say that Jet Jaguar was like Mecha Kong. <laughs> because like Jet, Jet Jaguar is like this Power Rangers looking motherfucker mm -hmm. in like a Lycra suit. And they've just put on the poster, no, it's, it's Metal, it's Mecha, God, it's Mecha Kong. Oh god. That's he looks nothing like me. It's just this Kamen Rider dude flying around <laughs> doing drop kicks. And he's like, no, 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 no. It's definitely, it's definitely Mecha God, uh, Mecha Kong. Yeah. It's so funny. But like the idea as well, he just made like that film. Like he made like the recreation of that movie. That's so funny. Of just, I love when you hear stories like that. Of just, oh yeah, as a kid, this director just tried to like recreate King Kong because he fucking loved it. Yeah, and it mentions here that um, King Kong eventually became one of his favourite films and was the primary inspiration for Jackson to become a filmmaker. So cool. And reminded of a great story from Steven Spielberg, because I got a subscription to Empire Magazine, mm -hmm. and there's a, this, it's called like the Legends Edition, where they just interviewed like all the biggest actors and directors in the world about what got them into film. And the story from Steven Spielberg is like genuinely fascinating, where he talks about mm. he went to see Lawrence of Arabia with his... Um, uh, I think he's dad. Yeah. And Lord's Arabia, do you know the, the bit where they're trekking across the desert? I mean, I, I'm sure I'd remember it if I saw it, yeah. Yeah, it's like, the, I can't show the trekking across the desert, and he's like, we were sat there in this, like, theatre, no one said a word, mm. and they got all the way across the desert, and we sat there in silence watching it, and then when they finally got to their destination, 
everyone in the audience stood up at once and went to the the um, the refreshment stand to get a drink because we were thirsty because the movie had made us thirsty because like that's the power of film mm-hmm. and that's what gave him his love of film of seeing how it impacts people to seeing an entire crowd of people they were thirsty watching how much the people on screen had like you know struggled through the heat that's really that's funny like, that's yeah funny. i just like that just this as you say it's this microcosm moment of that's what sparked his love of film mm-hmm. like that's seeing what influence film can have on people and not necessarily that he's like rubbing his hands together about man i'm gonna make like so many sales on sodas if i made a desert movie of just like no, everyone was impacted by the film at that moment to such a degree that they like all felt what the people on screen were feeling. Yeah, and that's what gave him his first glimpse into the effect film can have on people. And it's similar with Peter Jackson here. Of like, you no, know, he cried when Godzilla, like, he cried when King Kong died. Mm-hmm. And he mentions here that he paid tribute to the film by including Skull Island as the origin of the zombie plague in his 1992 film Brain Dead. Oh, wow, okay. The, the aforementioned brain dead, um, the zombie plague, it comes from Skull Island. That's a really funny little nod. I'm I'm just upset it wasn't like, rage-filled monkeys. Thing, I don't mind 28 Days Later, and I really appreciate 28 Days Later as a movie. Mm-hmm. I think 28 Days Later is legitimately a fantastic movie, and the production of that movie is fascinating. And if we get... If we're still making Wiki Weekends videos around Halloween, I would love to do an episode on it because the production of that movie was so interesting. Like, they shut down London for a day. It's the first mm. movie they ever did that. Um, yeah, I remember seeing like an uh, interview with Killian Murphy where he was just like, yeah, there is no way we could have got away with that nowadays. It would not let us do it. You know, I'll tell the story because hopefully if we ever do the, that episode, people have forgot by then. I mean, I guess great... if you want to continue to see videos going on for that long uh you need to be sharing and subscribing making sure we get those views get those clicks you do indeed yes there's a great story about the making of um 28 days later joe that first bit was just killian murphy walking through like the completely dilapidated city like london empty mm-hmm. he's walking through that and you have that i don't know the name of the song but it's you know the song the the 28 days later song mm-hmm. and it comes in very slowly throughout the um the scene and it builds up until, like, you know, where Killian Murphy, like, goes, where the fuck is everybody? Yes. Yeah. Initially, that scene had no music. Ooh. And it was in complete silence. And then Killian Murphy, if you remember, he bumps into a car and the car alarm goes off. Mm. Apparently, so many people jumped in their seats and complained about how scary that jump scare <laughs> was. They put the music in so it's that, like, you no, know, so the car alarm going off wasn't a surprise because it was too scary. It was that moment was too much of a jump scare. That's hilarious. And they had to like tone it down because they said people legitimately left the theater after that because they were so <laughs> pissed off. Um, no, they didn't just film early, early in the morning. They they had to like overturn bu- a bus and all this jazz, so they they yeah. did have to shut down like a big section of um, like central London. Yeah, it's same thing for, like with Vanilla Sky where they shut down Times Square, and it's the only time they've ever really done that. They shut down Times Square so Tom Cruise could just run through it like a dog let off his lead. And it, it is wild sometimes when you hear stories about like, what movie was the movie that was able to like get London shut down for a while, and it's 28 days later, this relatively, not massive budget, like relatively low budget film made on the back of Danny Boyle, who I think only really got big because of 28 days later. I still think it's a very good movie, yeah. I don't like the zombie lore, but, you know, you can just difference the zombies run now, who gives a I, fuck. I really enjoy a lot of Danny Boyle movies, and I do want to return to 28 Days Later because I haven't watched it in, like, 10-plus years, but in my head, it was still very good. It's worth going back to to watch the um, the alternate ending, which, you know what? Oh, God, is so bullshit. When it, you know what? Subscribe to his channel in six months' time. We'll talk about it. <laughs> so during the filming of Jackson's 1996 film, The Frighteners, Universal Pictures were impressed with his dailies and early visual effects work. Because he used a lot of practical effects, and that's the only real way you could have really realised a King Kong uh, then. Keep in mind, this is before like Jurassic Park and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a correction from Kaylee in chat. Like, train spotting was what put him on the map. Yeah, I'm getting the dates mixed up of like which came first, so apologies about that. Train spotting, train spotting wasn't like, no, the cultural... Well, it was, it was the cult hit, but it wasn't the, the phenomenon that 28 Days Later was. Mm-hmm. 
He mentions that here. The studio was adamant to work with Jackson on his next project, and in late 1995, offered him a chance to direct a remake of Creature from the Black Lagoon. Mm. He turned down the offer, but then Universal became aware of his obsession with King Kong and offered him the opportunity to direct that remake instead. The studio reassured Jackson that they didn't have to worry about lawsuits concerning film rights, the studio behind the original film, because the character is in the public domain. Which is even better, isn't it? There's no better cinematic universe in the public domain, Lucas. Yeah, again, anybody. our dark universe on the go, Carl. We're going to make so much money. Uh, Jackson initially turned down King Kong, but he quickly became disturbed by the fact someone else would take it over. And he continued and make it into a terrible film that haunted him. Eventually, I said yes. So he didn't want someone to take his film and make yeah. a bad one. Because that's the thing. Then you're not going to get another chance. Keep in mind, this was like, you know, the 90s, where they didn't reboot movies after two years. Yeah, that's the thing. He was like, thinking, like, I'm the one that's got to be in charge of this King Kong remake. Because if somebody else makes it, they might ruin King Kong for me. Yeah, and I won't be able to get another crack at it for another 30 years. Not realising, you know, in 20 years' time, Hollywood would be rebooting things every two years. <laughs> like, in 10 years, we've had two Spider-Man 2s, Lucas. Well, in, in 20 years, we've had three of them, right? Yeah. Sure. It is crazy. I think this is interesting as well. So, uh, Universal approved the script. was written by Robert Zemeckis as an executive producer. So, the guy who did, like... Forrest Gump and stuff. He's, yeah, he's a uh, Back to the Future guy, right? Yeah. But this is like the 90s version. So mm-hmm. originally it was going to be like um, uh, Robert Zemeckis. And early people attached were Weta Workshop. Of course. Who yeah. I believe still works with him in the um, uh, the revival. Yeah, yeah. It's nice to know, you know, even back then he was still giving Weta Workshop their props. Because mm-hmm. they were also the effects people on uh, all the Lord of the Rings as well and everything, yeah. Yeah. But it being filmed in the 90s, though, meant that the actors that were going to be cast were a little different. So initially, Kate Winslet was offered the part of the, uh, the female love interest, Anne Darrow. When I say love interest, she's the love interest of King Kong. And uh, Kate Winslet, that would have been... Kate Winslet's the one in uh, Titanic, right? And that would have been yes. around that time frame, so that does make sense. Yeah, and as for the other two characters, Jack Driscoll and Cal Denham, the uh, actors who were in the, the running were George Clooney and Robert De Niro. Which would have been a very different movie. That, I mean, both of them would have made very different movies to each other as well. Like, yeah. Robert De Niro and George Clooney give off such different vibes. To Adrian Brody and Jack Black. <laughs> yeah. However, development for King Kong was stalled when Universal became concerned over the upcoming release of the 1998 film Godzilla. So right. Godzilla scared... If we still make your fact theme videos... That'd have been a fact fiend title. Yeah. That'd be like, that time Godzilla scared King Kong out of the theatres. You know what? That might be the title for this. There we go. We can still do it. <laughs> it also, oh man, as well as other ape-related remakes with the 1998 film, Mighty Joe Young. Mighty That's Joe That's what I love, Young. Mighty Joe Young. Don't think I know that one. It's on Disney+. Plus. Go watch it. It's about just a really, really, really big gorilla called Joe. <laughs> okay. And he's just, he roams around, and it's like, he, 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 he's basically King Kong. But he's, right. he's not as big, like King Kong's like 20 feet tall in that Jackson movie. Uh, 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 is he 20 feet tall? Is he 50 feet tall? Is he 10 foot tall? Like, we it never... There is. Mm-hmm. But Mighty Joe, he's about 11 feet tall. But I like that one, because the ending of the film, it's very King Kong-esque, where it's like a little girl is trapped in a, uh, a Ferris wheel. Mm. And, like, the trainer says, Joe, go rescue her. And Joe climbs up the, uh, the Ferris wheel and rescues the little girl. But then the Ferris wheel collapses and it lands on Joe. But he saves the little girl. And the ending of the film is, she's like, what's going to happen to Joe? And it's like, we don't know. There's, there's nowhere for him to go. He's too big. And the little girl like, gets like $5 out of her purse and hands it to Joe. She hands <laughs> it to the gorilla and then all the crowd come in. And then the ending of a season, like this giant wildlife was like, yeah, Joe! Oh, good. At, at least not every single... Just fictional ape has to just get shot and killed. But it's, it's more, though, just like, I love that he's just so ginormous. Mm-hmm. And they never explain it. It's like, no, he's just big. So why is he so big? It's like, fuck you, he's big. I mean, I guess, like, if he's, what, 11, 12 foot, th- that's kind of one of those things of, it's a little bit exaggerated, but obviously, like, some humans have been, like, 8 foot tall before. Like, yeah, it, it makes sense, doesn't it? Like, you know, Robert Wadlow, like, 12 feet tall, I think he was. Definitely, wasn't, definitely wasn't 12 feet tall. 
I'm pretty sure he was about eight foot something. Let's have a look. There's no way he's twelve foot. Let's have a look. I did, I've also um some in chat like Oh yeah, he was I'll okay, say he was nine foot tall. Okay. Right, yeah. Uh, he the was Jackson, nine feet tall. The Jackson Kong started production, like potential talks were around Titanic time and then it got around the Titanic time, yeah. Two thousand and five after the Lord of the Ring. Which says here, with the financial and critical success of the Fellowship of the Ring and the Two Towers, Universal approached Jackson early two thousand three. During the post-production of Return of the King, con- like concerning his interesting restart and development on King Kong, which he did. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, I like the fact that they were just like, "Look, this Peter Jackson guy, he did want to do a King Kong film. We should reapproach him." And obviously, at the time, it's not reapproaching him because oh, this guy loves King Kong. It's like it's... No, that's the fucking guy from Lord of the Rings. Yeah, like they weren't just approaching him as a fan of King. Well, they knew they'd get him because they knew that he said yes earlier, but they told him to fuck off because. They didn't want to compete with Mighty Joe, yeah. And it does say a lot that this is very specifically Peter Jackson's King Kong. Yeah. And that's what you see. It's not just King Kong, is it? It's Pete, yes, like you said. Yeah, you see it everywhere. Even like the video game was like Peter Jackson's King Kong, the video game. Yeah. Yeah, which somehow looks better than the King Kong game they released, like what, last year? (laughs) That like blew the internet. And then visual effects, because this was a visual effects powerhouse. Yeah. I remember like just the amount of effort put into Kong. Mm-hmm. So Jackson saw King Kong as an opportunity for several technical innovations in motion capture technology, commissioning Weta Digital to supervise every aspect of Kong's performance. He decided early on that he did not want Kong to behave like a human, so he and his team studied hours upon hours of gorilla footage. Circus was cast in a title role, paired himself by working with gorillas at the London Zoo. Oh, and in yeah, my head, he's yeah. there interviewing the gorillas. <laughs> Unless he's just there with a pad and pencil. Like, and so what do you say about being a gorilla? It's like, hmm, okay, yes, yes, yes. So what would you do if there was a damsel in distress? Okay, got it. Just, um, um, I like the idea, though, that it's seen as some revolutionary idea that King Kong shouldn't act like a human. It's like, yeah, of course he shouldn't. Well, I think I kind of like the the way they do it in... Because obviously, I'd, in being a ginormous fucking gorilla, great. Mm-hmm. But when they want you to fight Godzilla, it's like, we can't be like 20 feet tall. And if he's as big as Godzilla, and he's still like a gorilla, he's going to be like 400 feet tall, about 400 foot wide, gorillas lean <laughs> forward so much. And I remember when we, we did like a wiki weekend for the Fact Fiend channel about it, where they decide to make him not quite human, not quite ape-like. They want him to just cast a very imposing silhouette. And I think the term they use that has lived in my head since that day is... They wanted Kong to have the silhouette of a tired god. So cool. It's such a good visual. And then you look at him, it's like, you know, the slumped shoulders, the like, mm-hmm. huge, mus- like, huge, ginormous figure, but slightly slumped of like they're tired. Mm-hmm. But they'll still fight because that's what the people of Skull Island need. And it's just, it's so just confusing as well because I haven't fully committed to watching AO's MonsterVerse movie. So is it just the one Kong? Because there's like bits where you it's the one like, Kong, yeah. But then there's talk about like Kong's parents were also like massive as well. Well, what they do to explain it is they say in Kong Skull Island, they say I think just there's a line from John C. Riley where it's like you know he's pretty small now, but he'll get bigger because they obviously were planning for the Godzilla fight, hmm. and he was like he's about like 200 feet tall in that movie, but Godzilla was 400 foot tall, right. and they show you like a skeleton of Kong's parents, like the last Kongs. And they're like jive fucking enormous. And then it's just that like everything on Skull Island is massive, right? Yeah, everything's ginormous, and they killed like the last of the Kongs, mm-hmm. or as the last of the Kongs as we saw so far. But it turns out there's like more Kongs living inside the Earth. It's like yeah, that's right. In that movie, they go down to the center of the Earth, and there's just gorillas living there. It's like my dream. And uh, also, thank you, Jen, for that little generous donation there. Much appreciated. But thank you for joining yeah. in. Like Jen Thompson, fan of the gorillas. And would you like to hear a fun fact about gorillas, Luca? Sponsored Always. by Jen Thompson. Always. So, do you know about like scientific nomenclature for like animals? Like, you know, um, like, you know, like a tiger is called like Panthera. Uh, sorry, a lion is called like Panthera Leo. And a right, tiger is like, yeah. like Panthera tigris. Mm-hmm. Do you know what the scientific name for a just generic gorilla is? Please tell me it's Homo apian. No, it's, it's gorilla. Do you know what the. Um, the uh, the scientific name for a western, oh sorry, for a lowland gorilla is. I'm gonna double down on Homo apian. I like it. It's it's gorilla gorilla. 
Would you like to guess what the scientific name for a Western lowland gorilla is? And I'm not making this up. You can look this up. Just Google scientific name Western lowland gorilla. I'm presuming it's gorilla, gorilla, gorilla. It is gorilla, gorilla, gorilla. <laughs> He's triple gorilla. The triple gorilla. Oh, man. Like, How amazing is that? Why like did they, they gave not have another naming. word? Why is they just it... gave up naming it, right? Just It's gorilla. I don't know. It's, it's more gorilla than the last one. It's like when you learn about, like, bears shouldn't be called bears. Bear is the word that people came up with because they were scared of what the real word for a bear is. So it's like the mort tech? No, basically, like, bears were seen as being so dangerous hmm. that the word for what a bear was was not allowed to be spoken, so they called them bears instead. And because no one said that word, we forgot what it was. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like the the Voldemort thing of like they yeah. should not be named. Just do and not it's name like, I think, what the bear is. I'd have to look this up, but I think like the word bear is just like that which should not be named. Mm -hmm. And it's to the point where I think like Antarctica like literally translates to like I, I think at, at, it's something it translates. You've got Antarctica and the Arctic. And it's like mm -hmm. bears and no bears. I think it translates to because <laughs> there's no polar bears there. It's like which one's the one without the bears? Yeah, something something stupid. Then I'd have to look this up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. It's like this a half remembered fact when I was at the zoo like ten years ago. But I remember reading like no one knows what bears are called. Like what is the fucking bear? <laughs> it's called a bear now. Yeah, like, bear is the word we used to describe it because people were scared of what the real word was. Oh man, that's cool. Can you imagine here that circus had to go through two hours of motion capture makeup every single day? Yeah, I am. Um... Like that—that that sounds rough. But when you hear it compared to all the, like you know, the the one that was mentioned quite a lot is the Grinch with Jim Carrey, where he like had to go through just training of like, here's what it's like to be tortured, so that when the Grinch outfit gets put on you, that you don't like, yeah, have PTSD from it, basically. Yeah, I think it's talking like seven hours of makeup a day, and he compared it to Chinese water drop torture, which for anyone who doesn't know is just they put it's a drop of water into a center of your forehead. It's an irregular interval. Mm -hmm. And you might think that's that's that that doesn't sound like torture. Mythbusters did an episode on this and like people go mad in like ten like ten minutes. Yeah, it's it's not long at all before it starts affecting people. Like imagine, for example, like just having like a hangnail that someone's constantly just tweaking at. Not enough to hurt. Do you know you've like you know got a hangnail in your sock or something? Mm. And you just you can never get comfortable. I mean, yeah. Yeah. But like, like that. I think the worst one for me when you bring up the Mythbusters one. Is they tested like the um, theory that they used to put bamboo underneath people, yeah, and like s let the bamboo just grow. And if they don't, you know, give into the torture, bamboo will just grow through people. Oh yeah, like just straight up, just like you will feel it slowly just grow into your body and out the other side. That was Lowe's like, yeah, like there's uh, the rat one, which is like seen in one of the Fast and Furious movies we mentioned earlier. It's a Fast and Furious movie. It's like, you know, you just put a bucket full of rats on someone's stomach and put a blowtorch on the top and the rats will burrow through your stomach to get out. Ooh. That's like a real thing. But, you know, let's move away from that. Yeah, and maybe let's the... stop. Oh, God. Oh, a, bit, a bit of trivia here. So we have some cinematic literary illusions and references to the original that were featured in the movie. If people maybe want to go rewatch it after listening to this. So Jack Black and critics have noted that Carl Denham's similarity. Oh, sorry. Jack Black and critics have noted that Carl Denham, the character, has some similarities to Orson Welles. You know, the, the noted director, writer. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, like, is, um, the, um, is the reason that they go to the place just to get footage of, like, random creatures and stuff? They just, yeah, they know some bullshit there. Like, yeah. Jack Black's character's like, hey, actress, would you like to come to this island? We're going to, like, you know, it's an untouched landscape. We're going to get good footage. Mm -hmm. And we're just going gonna to get a famous actress to go with us so, like, you know, we can hopefully cobble something together in the edit. Yeah. And then the fucking gorilla turns up. Because I was like, I couldn't remember whether they were just filming on an island and creatures show up or whether they knew that there was weird shit there. They just, they just knew the shit there that no one's seen, mm -hmm. like from sailors and stuff. It's like Skull Islands, like they tell about in stories, like there's weird shit on this island. Right, yeah. And then we have references to the original 1933 King Kong. Fay Ray, the original Anne Darrow from the 1933 movie, was asked by Jackson to appear in a brief cameo role where she would utter the film's final line. Twas, uh, Twas beauty that killed the beast. She initially flatly refused and then seemed to consider the possibility. However, she died shortly before meeting with Jackson. I was going to say, because if 
that film was been like fucking old, right? They would have been very old for filming a 2005 movie. Um, she died. She lived to 97 and died in 2004. Man, so she like she missed it by a year. Yeah, that's. Oh, I said, that's you know so what? Sad. Faye Ray, well fucking done. 97. That'd be well yeah. done, girl. But it is really sad that they couldn't just get that little cameo f- recorded before she passed away. You're the one of them that always blows my mind. Is that they got the original voice actress for, um, I think it was Alice in Wonderland. Right. From like like the 30s. Mm -hmm. They got her back for Kingdom Hearts. Oh my God. Uh, It was either her, it was basically someone from one of those like earliest possible Disney movies. And the Mm -hmm. only thing they'd ever done was that Disney movie and Kingdom Hearts. (laughs) Just replies in that role. Yeah. Their IMDb page is like Kingdom Hearts, a bunch of archive footage and interviews, Alice in Wonderland. Something or something lines, like yeah. that. Yeah, I don't know if it's is that movie. It's like basically just some actor who did one wrong, and they brought her back for Kingdom Hearts. Like 60, 70 years on, yeah. And it's like it's a record for like the longest time someone's reprised a role from. Um, an ad for Universal is visible while Kong is tearing up Times Square, and like you've got to do that, right? Yeah. If you're in classic. Times Square, I mean, I, I bet they had so many cool like like vintage ads in Times Square. Hmm. Yeah. So it reminds me a little bit of what... Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, it always kind of baffles me when, like, companies don't do it anymore. Like, we've mentioned multiple times of it's so weird when you, for example, play, like, Spider-Man 2 on the PlayStation, and why every not, technology not... product they're using isn't Sony products, is why... It makes, it makes no sense, given how much they'll plug their shit everywhere else. Mm-hmm. But it reminds me of like, one of the best, like, little bits of, like, just advertising I've seen. Mm. Like, at least, like, tie-in-wise, was for the... Um, the that shitty in 1997 Godzilla movie where they got an artist who did the comics. It was a comic artist. Mm. And what it was is for like Target or 7-Eleven or whatever, it's just, oh, here's like a, a poster for you of Godzilla stepping on your store. And just everyone who wanted to like get yeah. in, just here's one of Godzilla stepping on your store. That's pretty fucking cool. I thought it was great. And I thought, mm. what an interesting way. He doesn't, of course, like if God's going to step on something, why it can might as well be your store. Mm-hmm. I really like that. Yeah, but yeah, that's that's King Kong two thousand five. What a great movie! I'm gonna have to go back and rewatch it now. Yes, yeah. But uh, maybe I'll rewatch it in two parts because fucking hell, that three hour runtime sounds bad. Now nah. we say fifty minutes into our podcast talking about it. Ah, it's fine. It's fine, right? It's just it's wild to me because. You know, three hours nowadays has just become such a almost standard. And I'm like, it's one, yeah, it's bring one back HBO like HBO. ninety-two minute long movies. Never forget when I told I, well, I remember telling you about the Inspector Gadget movie that's like seventy minutes long. The, yeah, that's crazy short. I've taken shits longer than that movie. <laughs> Wild. So I think it's like it just scrapes by in terms of how long it needs to be for like a full yeah, theatrical to, release to legally be considered a movie yeah oh yeah king kong 2005 oh well i mean i guess we can go into a bit of housekeeping carl but it is funny that you've already mentioned my wiki for this week oh are you doing king are you doing Godzilla <laughs> i'm not, I'm not gonna say people i'm just gonna I'm gonna tease that for now you have, you have mentioned it Okay, so I've mentioned it at some point in the previous like uh, discussion about mm-hmm. King Kong 2005. Yes, you certainly have. But Carl, we do have to take a little housekeeping break first. We do indeed. And this housekeeping break is a little different from the ones we normally do because we're going to plug something. And we're going to plug something for a very good friend of mine. And that Ooh. is my friend Melissa, who is a cosplay model who is working on a short film. I have it in front of me now. She sent me a lovely little um, uh, package through that she sends to like uh, people. Is a short film called Frank and Babes from Beyond the Grave. There is a <laughs> link. Isn't that great? That's there, is great. A, there is a link to the Kickstarter down below, and the chat is open for like four more days or something like that. I said I'd do this to her as a. Because I saw her, she's been promoting this real hard. Mm-hmm. She's a good friend of mine. We've worked together. Like She's been in a few fact theme videos. Like She's been a friend of mine for like 10 years. She's one of the few people I can actually talk to about the trials and tribulations of online celebrity. Mm hmm. Because that's how we initially bonded of just like, I think the the joke she said to me once is, I, I'm naked on the internet for a living and you get weirder comments than I do. <laughs> so she's helping create this short film, Frank and Bass, and I, and 
I don't do ad reads, Lucas, which is known, right? I don't read stuff out as it's written, right? I mean, generally not, no. But I'll do that for Melissa. So I asked her to describe it in her own words, so I'll read those out for us now. Frank and Babe is a wickedly original horror short that pays homage to the 80s classics like Weird Science, Return of the Living Dead. After a group of burlesque performers meet a tragic end and unholy resurrection at the hands of a twisted mortician, sets the stage for revenge, unleashing gruesome mayhem with a modern twist. If that sounds interesting to you, you'd like to support a very, very good friend of mine and of the channel, you can check out the links below. But Lucas, it being a Kickstarter means there's a course rewards. And I signed up for the tier where I get a free poster and I get to choose which one of the Frank and Babe signs it, but I'm going to just message Melissa and say, can you sign it as well? <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. And the reason I'm going to ask her that is because I already have something signed by Melissa. So Lucas, do you remember the, the old office we had? I do remember that, yeah. Do you remember there was like a, just a random, just signed photo of a naked woman a mostly or at least naked a woman, semi-naked yeah. woman yes mm-hmm. well, that's because that was a, a a gift that melissa sent me as a joke one christmas we are keeping things safe for work it, on here this right? is safe for work yes but this is just like i think to sum up her personality and like you know how good friends we are oh fuck is it? this is like all my old posters um i i randomly so so what does it say on here again so, Carl, enjoy this cosplay from one of the worst movies of all time. And it's just her dressed as Harley Quinn's Joker. And, he's saying, and it says on it, to the biggest big dick YouTuber I know, Carl, your friend Melissa. Because, I, you and, know, I used to travel up to the office every few weeks and just like, one day I just walked in and was like, why is there just a framed signed picture of a half-naked woman in here? And I went, read the, read the, the label. And it's signed, anyway, why is it signed to you? If it was what it, why is that, like, in there, instead of, like, on a shelf somewhere? It was when I had a girlfriend who knew Melissa. Now I'm single, and I don't want to have to explain that. Every time, like, a potential partner comes around, and you're like, it's, why it's, is there a half-naked woman on your shelf? Do you know what, yo, know, first time you meet someone, you put stuff away. That's one of the things you put away. You don't have that on display. I'm very proud of it. Mm-hmm. I don't want to have it on display and have to explain it every time. <laughs> she's a very, very good friend, and I'm hoping that she will like, you know, sign the poster that I get for me. Mm. And I wish her all the best. And I'm so happy that she's moving into like, you know, uh, onto bigger and better things, which is like, you know, short movies and horror stuff and like she's collaborating with a bunch of her friends. And one of the other Kickstarter rewards, Lucas, I'm just gonna send you actually to describe to the people at home. In whatever um, way you feel is appropriate. Again, like, is it, if it's safe work, I can put it, like, live on screen. You can if you want, yeah, but just read it out. What do you see? What do I see? Yeah. Uh, I've got, I've got like, it's... ten tabs open. I'm like, let's get to the right one. Uh, the, the many, many tabs. Let's get to the right tab. Let's get to the... Uh, dear God. So what, what, what do you get, Lucas, if you <laughs> pledge to that tier? So, um, for the $75 tier, or about, 80, about £60 that ships... Anywhere in the world, estimated delivery October 2024, you get a Franken Babes sock and a Polaroid. And the Polaroid now, is uh, the description uh, one here. Of the... Yep. It does say uh, you own your very own Franken Babes sock. Just what, one, just the one. What you do with the one sock is your business. Along with the sock, you will get a one of a kind Polaroid from set featuring one or more of the Franken Babes. You do not get to choose which babe. It is a surprise. And maybe multiple. But yeah, what you do with the sock is just... That's on you. And I think that just sums up the sense of humour right there. We're going to send you a single branded sock (laughs) and a Polaroid of one of the many attractive ladies who appears in this uh, short film in various states of undress. (laughs) That's excellent. And that's like, what great branding, eh? And that's like, it's very tongue-in-cheek, very... For what I said to Melissa, I will happily promote this. She's not paying for this. She's a good friend. And I said, you know what would be really funny? If I just promote this, because I, I love promoting her stuff, just because everyone's like, how do you know her? You know you don't know her. And it's like, oh, no, well, look, she does. Like, have you not seen, have you not seen the, the poster? The, have you not seen the dedication to me? Oh, God, maybe... It uh... always cracks me the fuck up. Maybe well, yes. one day we can get a Frank and Babe to plug Wiki Weekends for us. Well, I think I we'll speak to her about like. Of know, course, but... yeah, like that's all just behind the scenes nonsense. But we just thought it would be very funny, and like I didn't even know what the project was. Carl just was like, "Hey, you know, hey, my if... friend's got a Kickstarter going, and you you've heard me talk about Melissa before. Can we just do this for fun? And because you know we get to do favors for our friends and family whenever we want." 
Yep. That's the one of the perks of owning, like, you know, not... No, actually, yeah, we do own this, right? It's 50-50? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was just checking, like, you, you own it and then you pay me, right? That's how it works. I mean, technically, but we have a gentleman's agreement this is a full 50-50 split of ownership. That is the way, yes. And, like, one of the perks of, like, the 50-50 split is, like, hey, if one of our friends is doing something, we can just mention it if we want. Mm-hmm. So, yes, I believe it's already reached its backing goal. So I think the, the backing goal that it needed to like, you know, get funded has been reached. If anyone would like you know, to support a good friend of mine and just get a very interesting um, conversation piece for your house. If anyone would like a single sock. Well, that's the thing as well. Imagine just having that on a shelf framed <laughs> next to the Polaroid. Hopefully not you. In, you know, for your feet, obviously. You know, you don't want a cheesy sock inside uh, that frame. Yeah, that's what I said. I've got for the poster, and I want to sign it for me. Yeah, but you know, obviously, if people want to go support them and get those Frank and Babes rewards, you can go ahead. Yeah, I believe there's also like links to um, uh, all the people working on it, like socials and stuff, so you can follow the projects there as well. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, but I did. I like. Yeah, she's not paying for this. Just a good friend of mine, and I thought it'd be very funny because just every time I mention, like, how do you know this person? That seems like the most not you thing ever, Carl. I'm I'm more than happy to promote Frank and Babes here on Wiki Weekends. That's, like no one looks at me and thinks that guy knows like cosplay models. It's like I do. And it's the what, weird what? thing, like no matter what kind of area of life there always seems to be that Carl knows a person. Like here's the thing: one day I'll tell the story of when she took me to like the over 18s night for cosplayers, and I went in, used the bathroom, and left. <laughs> It was like apparently it's like a really like big ticketed event, but because mm. I knew her, I was like, "Can I just come in and use the bathroom?" It's like, "Do you not want to stay?" I know I'm good. Yeah. So that's what happens when you're nice to people. When you're nice to people, they'll do you favors. Like I'm doing for her. But yes, also right now, if you're doing housekeeping, while well, the plug around stuff, right? We might as well, yeah. Yeah. So Lucas, you've got a Twitch, right? You got a Twitch. I do have a Twitch indeed. What's, and... What what was the name of that Twitch? Where people find that Twitch? That would be twitch.tv slash Legend of Canto. That's all right. You are a legend. Let's go. And obviously that has just been posted in chat live uh, for everyone live. And for everyone not watching live, the links are in the description that we've mentioned. But yeah, um, uh, you know, uh, currently as you're listening to this uh, tomorrow, so that's Thursday, 10 p.m. UK time. I will be doing some competitive Pokemon battling. Uh, feel free to come and challenge me in chat. I'm just learning the ropes of like Pokemon VGC so that I can hopefully go forth and like enter a tournament next year. That'd be fun, yeah. You know, it's the one thing. It's slow going, but slow and steady wins the race. Yeah, it, it takes a long time to learn the ins and outs of an entire game's like competitive systems and metas and all that jazz. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, and I guess I also have a Twitch, which will also be linked below or you know put live in the chat if you are watching like you know at home along with us. Mm -hmm. And I have not streamed a lot lately, admittedly, because I've been. Not well. You probably heard me coughing a little bit. A little bit. That's because I had the whooping cough, boss. I had the whooping cough. It was. And I'm uh... fine. I'm fine. But Lucas, you met me on the weekend. Where I'm in the recovery <laughs> phase now. It was not great, right? It was very funny. Just after a few drinks, like Carl was like, "Right, we're playing Smash Bros, but like I'm gonna just lie down in bed." And it genuinely felt like me and my friend were like visiting Carl in hospital because he was like just coughing away and it's like, like the oh. moment. Which is, like, I called my mum of, like, do I need to go to, like, the hospital? And she went, well, you're over the worst of it now. It's just fluid settles on your lungs when you lie down. Mm -hmm. So avoid, like, sitting in recliners. Like, thanks. Which is annoying, because I've got Dragon's Dogma 2, and I want, I've got a recliner. I sit in, as soon as I did that, I start coughing. So I've got to sit up like an absolute knob. Oh, <laughs> dear, oh, dear. Oh, Speaking of which. But, yeah, you can go find Carl over at Carl's Wood on Twitch, and he usually, over the weekend, normally on Fridays, but... You know, that changes with this social life. Uh, yep. Usually streams Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. On yes, the so this week it will either be Friday, but I'm at uh, the Insomnia Gaming Festival. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going there with Brad because we got tickets for it because a mutual friend of his... No, it's mutual friend of ours is going and invited us. And went, yeah, why not? Yeah. So we'll be at that. So maybe Friday night if we get back early enough. If not, it'll be Saturday because I've got like stuff to do that day. So I'll be at the festival that day. So mm -hmm. I'll be here. So... If it's not Friday, it'll be Saturday, and I'll definitely stream it. I'll definitely have a few beers. And I and guess, like, you know, if anyone happens to be at that Insomnia event over the weekend, Carl will be there to say hello to. But just 
Don't do that thing that you did at the, the Pokemon event where someone just like, nearly poke calls eye out of like, I know who you are. Yeah, he's like again, like it's the thing I can I um uh, often just like talk about with Melissa of when people recognize you but they don't know from where mm-hmm. and they get weirdly aggressive that you don't know where they know you from. And they do a thing where I I it's not I'm not a fan of it. I don't like people point but no one likes to get people pointing at the face. So they they point and they go, "Where do I know you from?" It's like, "How am I supposed to know?" <laughs> cuz it's funny cuz you would assume well the answer should just be well, you know me from YouTube, but and Carl accidentally did that to like yes. my friend one time, and she was, "Oh no, you're Lucas's friend, right?" And he's, yeah. "Oh, it's like it's There's so embarrassing t- if you do it wrong." If you make the assumption that they know you because you're on YouTube, because I, mm-hmm. and it's happened before as well, where someone recognised I went to university with them and I forgot. <laughs> and they're like, "Oh, where do I know you from?" And I was like, "Oh, I've got a YouTube channel. Like, no, we went to university together." So I'd never like to assume. Mm-hmm. It's never a good thing to assume, like you know. Um, uh, uh, if you assume, you make an ass out of you and me. That's what they exactly. say. But yeah, if anyone is going to that this weekend, I happen to be there. Like Brad will be there the entire thing, I believe, and I'll be there on the Friday, possibly the Sunday. Oh, goddamn, yeah. And Carl, speaking of making an ass out of you and me... Yes, well, I'm, while you're doing that, I want to grab another beer. What? I need to go back to talk about what I think we're talking about. I think most people probably are aware of what I might have brought to the table. What, what have you brought to the table, mon frere? Well... As you did guess, Carl, I have brought the good old 1998 American science fiction monster film, Godzilla. So here's the beauty of Wiki Weekend. When we say which wiki won this week, no one's going to fucking vote for that movie. as like <laughs> straight up vote. But the conversation we're about to have might be worth it. It might it be, might yes. top the talk of gorilla, gorilla, gorilla. Oh, God. Just, just tell me about the 1990s. You say eight. 98 American 98, okay. film, yeah. I don't know why I said 97 earlier. Uh, yeah, for some reason in my head, I thought it was 97, and when I googled 97 Godzilla, it came up with this from 98, okay. and I was like, okay. I guess we both just like randomly thought it was 97. Bear in mind, that would put us in the age range of like five, six years old, so we don't know, like, you know. Well, we we'd, have been, happen. we'd have been the primary audience for that movie. Fucking idiots. <laughs> yeah. Right? Basically, yes. And um, Godzilla, uh, or known as Gojira, is a 1998 American science fiction monster film produced by TriStar Pictures. It is, oh. it is called the 23rd Godzilla film in the series, but more it, notably the first American Godzilla film. Yeah, and I am a big fan of Godzilla, so I know a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff about this, which will no doubt be covered anyway. Cause that's I'm sure it'll come up in the conversations. Yeah. If, if anything gets missed, I can like fill us in on the blanks here. But the thing that's... is, it's a fine movie to watch if you just ignore that it's called Godzilla. If it's just like you're looking for dumb kaiju film, like it's not as bad as like maybe people make out, but it did fucking ruin the reputation of Godzilla. It reminds me of it. Reminds me of when you like that DMC like Devil May Cry game. Of mm-hmm. if you ignore that it's called Devil May Cry, it's fine. It's, it's a right. solid. It's a solid seven, eight out of ten. Mm-hmm. But it's just when it gets lumbered with the Devil May Cry license, it's like okay, now I've got to judge it as a Devil May Cry game. It's not great. It's like this is like yeah. it'd be a fine giant monster movie. Like if I say if they just change things, it's a Cloverfield. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, right. Like there's. There's plenty of completely inoffensive big monster movies like Cloverfield out there, and that would probably be, you know, this this movie would probably be grouped in with a lot of them because it is made by Roland Emmerich, who um, oh yeah, they did uh, Independence Day, right? Yeah, Roland Emmerich's such a weird guy, hmm, because like he he directs and like produces those like blockbuster movies. I've just got a list of his stuff he's done here of like. Universal Soldier, Independence Day, Independence Day Resurgence, Godzilla, The Day After Tomorrow, 10,000 BC, 2012, Moonfall. Do you know the one where it's like the fucking moon is attacking people and it's like they've got to run away from gravity? <laughs> what? But also, no, I'm, I'm not aware of that, to be honest. Yeah, Moonfall is where it's like, do you know what, in um, 2012, where it's like they, there's a scene where they run away from global warming? Mm-hmm. Remember that? This is a thing that happens in 2012, the movie. Where yeah. like global warming is chasing them down a hallway, <laughs> and you see like ice creeping up down the hallway, and they run into a room and start throwing books onto a fire. They're, they're literally burning the collective knowledge of mankind. 
And then that's the, the same movie, it. right, where like the earthquake chases the plane very strategically. Yeah. 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 He made what he made another movie called Moonfall, where it's the fucking moon explodes, and you have a shot where the moon is visible. Hmm. So already, like, if the moon was visible and it's like close enough where you can fucking see it, you're dead. Yeah. And, it, and the moon chases people and they run and jump inside a shed. And suddenly <laughs> the moon doesn't get them anymore. Like they're running away from the moon. But also on top of that, he also directed The Patriot, which is a really good movie. Mm -hmm. Although it is uncomfortable to watch where I don't buy this. Mel Gibson playing someone who's not racist. <laughs> like he plays like it's a guy. very unbelievable. Yeah, it reminds me of my favourite Frankie Boyle joke. I remember where Mel Gibson was cast as like William Wallace, like the Scottish hero. Mm. And I was like, you can't have Mel Gibson play a Scotsman. And now look at him, an alcoholic racist. Oh, God. Oh, fucking hell. I was like, but he directed like that movie as well. Mm -hmm. that, that's a roller coaster of a career right there, Mr. Emery. It's like when you look at like Ang Lee's like filmography. Mm -hmm. It's like the Hulk movie, but then he's, he did like fucking Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Yeah. It's like... Roland Emmerich, where he's like one of the most out so here, one of the most outspoken gay men in Hollywood. Oh right, okay. But he near exclusively makes just dumb blockbusters. Mm hmm But he's like a huge advocate for gay rights and donates loads of money to um uh, gay rights charities and like he's really a big fan of like avant garde out there arts that is like, you know for like, you know, for gay people to like express themselves. But then he makes like the most milk toast middle of the road blockbusters. Yeah, I was gonna say like Independence Day is like the most like straight edge, straight man America hoorah movie I can think of. Like I'm sure that you know there's a few examples worse, but yeah, that's that's quite surprising. But like you know, it's, we it's weird, right, to think of like he's this really outspoken advocate for gay rights. Like, what's the film he's most known for? Day After Tomorrow. I was saying, like, uh, someone in chat's mentioning I got Day After Tomorrow in 2012, confused, but he also did that. I mean, they're like, both very similar feeling movies, but one's got Jay Gyllenhaal in at least. Yeah. But the one that, yeah, the, the movies he's most known for, like, directs, like, Godzilla. Like, you think he'd be, like, John Waters or something, directing movies like that. Mm -hmm. So, no, he just directs shitty blockbusters. I mean, get your bag, right? Get your bag. Yeah, get paid. You get. Tell me more about 1998 Godzilla, though. So yes, it was directed by Roland Emmerich, produced by Dean Devlin and director Roland, among many others. The film was written by Dean and Roland as well. Um, Godzilla's plot follows the mutation of a marine iguana. Yeah, iguana! Who then goes to cause havoc across the South Pacific before making landfall in New York City. And which wiki are you on right now? Because I was just on Wikipedia. I am on the godzilla.fandom.com. Ah, okay, so that'll have some extra info then, because presumably that'll talk about the uh, the response from, like, Toho. Um, hopefully it does, yeah. I There was strengths and weaknesses of a few different wikis that I tried, but this summed things up in, like, a decent way and had some interesting tidbits as well, so yeah, that's the one I ended up um, jumping on in the end, because the Wikipedia one was very lengthy in all of its explanations. Yeah, and also as well, um, just right away, you've already got... Oh, that's not great. Godzilla's a mutated iguana. Yeah. That was Which just feels like that. it feels like Roland Emmerich watched the movie and assume that's what happens in the original. It's like, no, in the original, Godzilla was always there. Mm. It's just Godzilla is like a primordial destructive force of nature who is awoken by man's hubris by creating weapons beyond its control. I was gonna say, because like, isn't it that it's just alerted to like the existence of humans and their destruction because of the nukes that they launch yeah, into the ocean. The nuke awakens Godzilla, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think this role and I genuinely thought he just mutated a lizard. It's like, no, Godzilla is beyond that. And I believe the way it was Godzilla was described in like by an early director is Godzilla is our punishment. Right, like, yeah. Like Godzilla does not have I I think it was like in response to the question of is Godzilla a boy or a girl? Because uh, in like the Godzilla West is just an entity beyond our knowledge. Yeah, well, Godzilla in American films is largely referred to as male. And do you want to mention earlier they bill Godzilla as themselves? Mm -hmm. They always bill Godzilla as himself. But then in the nineteen ninety eight in Japan, they see it the other way of like it's female. No, uh, in Godzilla, uh, the the King of the Monsters. That's why it normally comes from like Godzilla, King of the Monsters. King mm -hmm. is normally you know it's a male title. Yeah, that's not a title they use over in Japan, and they normally use like. Just neutral pronouns for Godzilla. Oh, okay. The 1998 movie, Godzilla is female because Godzilla mm. lays an egg. Yeah. 
And then when they asked that direct, they asked the director, I was like, okay, so he's Godzilla a boy or a girl. It's the king of the monsters, but it doesn't say in the movies. What's the deal? They said, well, Godzilla is beyond such things. Godzilla is a god. I mean, that's the thing is, we're utilizing King of the Monsters as a title for Godzilla. It's a but it's, yeah. I presume, like, King of the Monsters is more just like King being like the ruler of the monsters. Yeah, more also than as well, necessarily like, about like the gender of Godzilla. It was also what's the famous quote like? What is a king? Like, what is a a god to a king? What is a king to a god? Yeah. <laughs> so you've already got God right there in the name. I love the idea that it doesn't get much higher like, than that, right? Godzilla, when he invaded New York City, was just like, or when they invaded New York City, um, just Godzilla was like, him, yeah. oh yeah, you you remember that as a big cataclysmic event? To me, it was just a Tuesday. So you just use him because it gets really confusing. Yes. Because mm-hmm. so that's why I think over in the West we use him, but I wanted to clarify that like Godzilla is canonically a non-binary icon. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. It's funny, just the first thing here. Like, Godzilla was intended to be the start of a trilogy of Godzilla films. However, it a was sequel, a start of something. Oh, the sequel may have been cancelled shortly after it began development due to poor critical reception and fan feedback. Yeah, no shit that that didn't get turned into a trilogy. I would have loved to see him, though. I would have loved it if it was like they were contractually obligated to make another one. Oh, God. Like... I would have loved to see what wet, flaccid fart they'd come up with. Just presumably, the... this did not make a lot of money. It made enough, but I think oh, it's okay. they went all in on they went all in on the marketing. Yeah, and we'll we'll talk about that later. As a section uh, mentions a couple of yeah. cool marketing things, um... they went all in on the marketing, and that's what cost them. It's the yeah. same thing like a lot of like Suicide Squad. It's like mm. a huge. It was a huge. It didn't cost that much to make, but they spent like two hundred million on marketing. That's normally I where. I find it very funny that. Um... Basically, the opposite happened with Aquaman 2. They could tell Aquaman 2 was going to flop just because they've already said, like, fuck it, this means nothing. We are cancelling the entire yeah. universe when this is done. And they just basically ignored marketing it and just just cut costs because they were, well, either we're going to market the fuck out of this film and it's not going to make much money, or we're not going to spend all that money on marketing and it's not going to make much money. Doesn't matter. So let's just let it go out and die. Uh, but yeah, it does have um, information here. The budget was 130 million, um, so not quite that 205 million that um, King Kong ended up hitting. But 1998, 130 yeah. million is still probably quite a lot. Also, probably a lot of fucking. Like I said marketing. You can double that at least for marketing. Exactly. This movie was everywhere. That's generally the the rule of thumb to go with when you're talking about big, massive Hollywood blockbusters. Is Roughly what they spent on the budget, they will also spend on marketing. So, like, yeah, double and it, it. And if it's a big tentpole movie like this, they'll probably spend a lot more. Yeah, and um, the box office in return. So, say, like, you know, double that, $130 million, Maybe they spent $260 million on it. And the box office return was $379 million. So about $100 million, which is not good returns. It not sounds like right. a lot of money until you realise, like, when you've got to pay one on the back end. But to spend two hundred something million to earn three hundred something million, yeah, not that great a return on investment, really. But not, not like oh, it bombed to fuck and made like negative money, like I might have assumed. But I guess just that Godzilla name holds a lot of weight. It's also as well like when you're making sequels, for the most part, sequels will make less money than the first one. Mm. Just near, and all. There are exceptions, of course, but for the most part, each sequel will probably make the same, if not a little bit less money than the first one. And so you want the first one to make, like, you know, four times its budget. I guess which maybe still makes that's... it worth green light, and the second one to make three times its budget. I guess that's maybe not always true because, like, anything that proves to be successful into a, like a full franchise, a franchise, yeah, of course. Like, but yeah, if it's like two movies where if they made like, you know movie number one and movie number two and stop there, it's probably because the sequel was not as successful and they ended it, but then the things that generally make it to three plus are the franchises that just keep steamrolling. Yeah. yeah. It's normally around like the three, the third or fourth one where it starts to dwindle. Mm. Apart unless you're like, as we mentioned earlier, just Fast and Furious, it just keeps going. Makes more money every year. Um, but yeah, it says there was an animated series created by Jeff Klein and Richard Rainis and then distributed the, the by The only Tristar. good thing about the entire thing, yeah. Is that, is that legitimately it, okay? It's legitimately great, yeah. 
Right, okay, because I didn't realise there was like, anything animated about this one. It's legitimately fantastic, and the plot is there's just Joe on the eggs mm-hmm. from like the end of the movie. Just they find one of the eggs, and they take oh. that, that they take that Zilla, they train it, and they just go around the world fighting um, uh, cartoon monsters. It's basically, <laughs> do you remember like Mega XLR? How fucking good that was! Yeah, that was great. Yeah, it was like that of just like monster of the week, literal monster of the week of oh, our baby Godzilla is going to go fight another random monster that mutated someone on Earth. Also, Ryan and chat, like, do not worry. We will get to the quote unquote like Jurassic Park rip off part in this wiki as we keep going. But for now, it'll say that it like, is fucking blatant. <laughs> I will. I'm I'm curious to to read it fully. I did give it a glance, but um. I didn't know about this, so I'm I'm very like interested to find out. But yeah, the uh the plan for a trilogy fell through. Toho revived the Godzilla series early in Japan and created the Millennium series of films, which ran from yes. 1999 to 2004. In part um, because they were so annoyed about this one, but it's like they were they were really kind of done with Godzilla apparently, and they were mm-hmm. like, "Fuck it, yeah, we'll sign the rights over to America. Who gives a shit?" They saw how bad the movie was, and they were like. In sense that this, like, you no know, iconic symbol of Japan, had been westernized and shitified. I went, no, we'll make a better one. Mm-hmm. We'll bring it back. Do you know, like when we talked about it in a fact theme video of they brought back Dragon Ball because Akira Toriyama was so mad at the live action Dragon Ball movies. Like, mm-hmm. I'm not having that be the last fucking thing that's dropped Dragon Ball on it. Like, I'm not letting fucking Godzilla '98 be the end of Godzilla's legacy. Well, that's what it would have been, yeah, because that's mm-hmm. if they didn't continue the series, that would have been the last Godzilla movie. God, can you imagine? Exactly, and they didn't want to deal with it. So, fuck it, we're going to reboot Godzilla and make a proper one. And I love that. I love that pure spite. Mm-hmm. Oh dear God! And um, well, let me just scroll down here for a little bit. It's just the idea they were so pissed off, like, no, we're gonna make our own Godzilla. Mm-hmm. With like, um, no, with, with Megalosaurus and everything. Yeah. So I I just scrolled through the plot, and I'm like, you know what? We don't need to talk through the plot of this movie. It's like there was a big Godzilla attack. Godzilla laid some eggs. Godzilla got attacked. It wasn't the best movie. And they kill Godzilla by shooting it with a missile, which is, I think, that yeah. was the single plot. That was the single point of contention with Toho that they were really annoyed about. But they were they signed over basically complete creative freedom mm-hmm. because they didn't they didn't think that they would treat Godzilla like that. Yeah, they was like, oh yeah, they're going to treat Godzilla with like due due dil- like with the reverence and put the due diligence into like the care. It's like no, they just and I believe a, and I believe a quote from uh, it was the original. Godzilla actor, the suit actor, mm. when he was asked of like, what do you think of like the Godzilla in that movie? He's like, it's such an American thing to just kill it with a missile. Yeah, it's such an American thing that they can't conceive of a thing that they cannot destroy with their guns and bombs. Despite the fact that literally Godzilla's whole point is that they set off a bomb, the most powerful thing they've ever invented, thinking we yeah, oh, we've got the big dicks now, mm-hmm. and Godzilla turns up to prove them wrong. America took that concept. It's like, no, but we've got the best bombs. We'll we have kill it with so a missile. many bombs. So many. And just like, I find it really interesting that, like, the idea that you've got this thing and just what do you do with Godzilla in the first movie that's meant to be a trilogy? Let's kill Godzilla. And obviously they lay the egg. Yeah. But dear God, like, the first thing that you're going to do is be like, let's murder Godzilla. Well, that's the thing. That's why, like, people in Japan were so pissed off, like Toho were like they asked for the rights to Godzilla and they kill it off in the first movie <laughs> and they kill it off and it's not it's, it's killed by the American military and they felt as a slight to like, oh of course, like Japan could never fucking kill Godzilla in any of their movies but we did, mm-hmm. with one of our missiles and then... like, do you not go ahead did, yeah. did they not watch Shin Godzilla, which you know is later but yes. there was a scene in Shin Godzilla well, they, they somehow get Godzilla to, like, they knock him out, mm. and he's not sat, and they have, like, a big, like, the classic Godzilla meeting scene, where it's all the government officials, and, like, what are we going to do? Godzilla's asleep. We've got, like, <laughs> a day to figure out how to fucking kill it. What do we do? And they say, here we go. How about we strap, like, a thousand missiles to every bullet train in Japan and launch them at his head? Oh, my God. And what they do is they spend five minutes crashing bullet trains into Godzilla's head, and all it does is wake him up. <laughs> and then in the American one, they shoot one submarine torpedo and it kills Godzilla. 
Oh. What's the think about that? It's like they literally just shoot. They crash bullet trains full of missiles into it for an entire minute. And then isn't there like something in Godzilla media that they did where like the real Godzilla meets Zilla? Yes. And then yes, instantly so... murks it because it's like not real Godzilla, it's American Godzilla. Yes, yeah, so uh, it probably mentions it in that wiki, but um, the ris- when Toho got the rights to the movie back when Tristar did nothing with it, mm-hmm. they immediately canonized the Godzilla from that movie. They immediately canonized it and said, it's not Godzilla, it's Zilla. Zilla, yeah. Zilla. And they even say in like the comic where they introduced it, it's often mistaken for Godzilla, but you can tell it's not Godzilla because it's much weaker than its <laughs> Japanese counterpart. And then in Godzilla Final Wars, um, which is like a big just monster mash movie where they bring back a bunch of old villains, mm-hmm. the enemies of that movie are bringing in like old Godzilla villains to fight Godzilla. And they bring in Zilla. Right. They, just, they just teleport Zilla down and... A story from behind the scenes I'm inclined to believe is that they deliberately made the CGI as shit as possible. <laughs> and they said we can make the CGI, you know, make it bad because the American one was bad. Because they all looked play. awful, yeah. And then they play like 10 seconds of a Sum 41 song. And you think it's going to be a fight scene and Godzilla just throws Zilla away and just atomic fire breaths it instantly. Instantly kills it, yeah. You know I mean? they, they play like this butt rock riff from some fight and you think, oh, it's going to be a fight scene and Godzilla's, no. <laughs> it's like, and they it's... deliberately made the CGI as shit as possible. Just like a bug on Godzilla's windscreen and just like, whoop, <laughs> it's gone. It's more the fact they play Sum 41 that cracks me up. That's, That's what gets so me. But they think what's the most like nineties American non-offensive like pop rock we can play? Some forty one. God, I don't know. Um, you mentioned here, Carl, the marketing of this the movie. The marketing is the funny. Yeah, it's better than the movie. Um, so it says that the marketing campaign for Godzilla was a multi-pronged in its execution. There were crushed cars dotted around London as part of a guerrilla they, they were fun, campaign. Yeah. I, uh, you know, ironic using the term uh, God's guerrilla advertising when it's talking about it's fucking Godzilla. Like yeah. King Kong it's, just waiting. Well, what, what I was planning to do before I like got into YouTube was go into marketing. Because mm. I fucking love this stuff. I love it. Like, um, PlayStation have been really fun with it over the last few years of like, oh man, like just there's been like a giant Spider Man 2 truck just webbed up in the Art de Triomphe in yeah, Paris so and good, stuff. Yeah. It's like, oh man, I love that stuff. Like, um, there's a couple of really great ones. Uh, uh, one that I really like is for the Transformers movie. Mm-hmm. There's, had, again, a crushed car, and the sign said reserved for Megatron. <laughs> and it's just a crushed car, because like, it was Megatron's parking space. Yeah, I think there was, like, um, one of the giant, like, machines from Horizon just, like, yeah. spotted somewhere in Australia or something. I, I say I love my, when they, like, you know, they have fun with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they had a lot of fun with this one. Like I said the, the crushed cars, like, Godzilla steps on this car. Yeah, and um, in the month or so before its release, Ad Streets on Corners made references to Godzilla's size in comparison to whatever medium of advertising the advertisement was based on. I like that as well. For example, his foot is bigger than this bus, his head is bigger than this billboard, etc. It's like when, um, what is it now? Uh, I think Jurassic Park, when that the Jurassic World was coming out, mm. it was like the company that provided like the tranquilizer rifles sold the tranquilizer rifle that Chris Pratt used, and it said on the thing that it was like, oh, what's the game you can hunt using this? And they put, like, T-Rex on there for a little bit. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's, it's you can use it to hunt a T-Rex. Mm-hmm. And I, I love, you know, trying to contextualize fake things into reality, and yeah, one thing that I've just, like, got on my shelf from when I went to Japan, one of my favorite little trinket things. Oh, yes, is it? Are you going to remember what it was? Yeah, I know what it is going to Is this the one? It's um just like some pills from Umbrella Corporation. Yes! And it was just like a little, like, you know, bottle pill of, like, medicine from Umbrella. that which It was just a little packet of sweets. Yeah. But I just love the idea that they made them all look like actual pills that you could buy it's from just on Umbrella. Your shelf. It's mm-hmm. just on your shelf. People go, why the fuck do you have that? And it's and like, you oh, put it in just Umbrella Corporation, take your medicine, and it's like, yes. And you put it on your shelf next to your Frank and Babe sock. <laughs> then you put it in the sock, you spin it around, you beat people with it. Uh, yeah, I am, I am 
fully aware that gorilla has nothing to do with gorillas. It's just a funny word. It's yeah. just and a Luke's... funny thing to bring up when we're talking about Godzilla versus Kong. And I apologize, Luke. I'm just gonna pop to the bathroom dead quick. So I don't like doing this in the middle of a podcast, but oh, Carl, it's doing it. So I am. So just give me one minute. Okay. Well, we can go to like a quick break that I can cut out and just like you know, hopefully everyone in chat is doing okay. I'll just have a read through and react to chat, and hopefully I can remember to cut this out of the uh, final podcast version. Um. need to talk about the fact that Toho laughed when they saw the Godzilla design, but something like get the new Godzilla, we keep the old. I mean, yeah, like I think very much that was the the attitude when they were like talking about just as Carl said, they just signed over like pretty much everything of just do whatever you want. I'm sure you'll be faithful and very representative of what Godzilla is and very respectful of the source material. And, you know, the classic, like, Japanese to American translation thing happened of, like, no, no, we're not going to adapt this, like, beloved Japanese thing very well. We're just going to take it and fuck it all the way up. Of, like, we're going to do a Netflix anime adaptation on your ass. I can only apologize. It's all good. But, yes, um, no, it's, it's one of those of us just saying, like, yeah, of course, like, when you give Americans like the full rights to a, a Japanese beloved product, they're just going to do like a Netflix and fuck it all the way up. I think Japan needs to start doing that and start making like animes of American things. Like they need to give them SpongeBob <laughs> and make a bad anime adaptation as you like it. The thing is, you know they'd make such a badass anime adaptation. I think they probably would. Anyway, if we just give myself one second to take a clip. Just five seconds of silence and then a clap so I know where to go. Yep. Oh, but Carl, you have taken your little pee break and we are back yes. for more wiki. And it does say um, here that going on from the whole, like, your head is bigger than this bus, bits and pieces of different body parts of Godzilla were shown on TV commercials and posters but never the entire body. This Which is to... cool, right? Yeah. Just like, to give you a glimpse of how big Godzilla is. It's like to add a bit of mystery as to the design of the creature, ideally prompting people to see the film because that was the only way to see the whole creature. However, Carl, can you guess what spoiled and ruined this entire marketing part? It's going to be, because I remember they did like a Taco Bell They thing. did do... But it wasn't the Taco Bell thing necessarily. Was it not like a toy and like a Happy Meal or something? Oh, so okay. So it, that might have also been part of it, but there was just a toy line in general released before. A toy line, okay. It's everything. always toy lines. It's always toy lines. The amount of times Marvel like cameos and spoilers and new like versions of characters have been spoiled by me just walking past a Funko Pop, and they're like, yeah. "What do you mean? Like, what do you mean, giant Ant Man?" And it's like, yeah, that's just that's in the movie, but the movie's not out yet. So thanks, Funko. And do you know why that is? Um, I'm not that, aware of it now. It's because the toys have to get made so many months in advance. So weirdly, one of the earliest design that gets finalized is the toy design. Because mm. if you want the toys to come out in time for the movie, they need like at least six months of runtime, which means they need to know what the fuck that character's going to look like day one. So there can't be any difference, and yeah. it has fucked up so many productions. There's like a famous, not famous, like kind of niche, but it's like I remember it because it's a Star Wars thing where it's like Kylo Ren's personal, like Tie Bomber. Right. They had, toy, yeah. they had a toy of that made, and they sent the toy in, and Ryan Johnson went, The, uh, the gun's in the wrong place. Oh no! We, the gun's not. That's not where the gun is in our version. So they changed the movie because it's easier to change the movie version than the yes, toys. Yes, yeah. that's exactly what they did because they said, "Can, can we change?" It's like, no, we've only made like a million of these things. Unless you want to like scup, scrap them all. We went, oh, we've also, so they, it was cheaper to just move the gun <laughs> with CGI in the movie. The toy changed the movie. Oh, it's, of course, yeah. And it happens all the time. It's like the Avengers already... suits. Do you know those like CGI suits they wear in like Endgame? Mm-hmm. That's a the reason they look so shit and simple is because the fucking Funko Pops already been made. Yeah, they couldn't change them. It's so much harder to dump a bunch of plastic that they've already paid for than it is to just re CGI something. 
Yeah. So that's why, that's like, why you know, I'm... a lot of, like, superhero costumes end up looking kind of bad now. Because mm-hmm. the toys for them are already, like, made, so they can't change them. So It's so funny. Uh, and, you you know, talking of toys, the Taco Bell had tie-ins such as cups and toys that promoted the film. I'm not sure whether that's the same as the toy line or different. I'm not sure whether that's the same toy line they're referring to that, like, spoiled everything. But um, the Taco Bell Chihuahua... Yes, I was about to mention that. There which was a... I wasn't sure. Like, I didn't realise that was a thing. Yeah, Taco Bell was really racist in the 90s. So they had like their their mascot was like a Chihuahua because Mexico, you mm-hmm. know, Taco Bell's American, and he's like, oh, a Chihuahua, a famously tiny dog, Godzilla, the marketing rights itself, right? Yeah, it was a uh, the the Taco Bell Chihuahua was also the height of popularity in Taco Bell's television commercials. So during the summer of 1998, several commercials pairing Godzilla with the tiny Taco Bell mascot were produced and aired including several with the Chihuahua trying to catch Godzilla in a tiny box, whistling and calling, Here, lizard, lizard, lizard. And then when Godzilla appeared, the Chihuahua says, Uh-oh, I think I need a bigger box. Here's the thing, is that more or less offensive to the character of Godzilla than making him a cop? Yeah, right, like, what's, what's worse? I was about to say, that's kind of, like, bad, given, like, you know, how iconic and important a character is mm-hmm. to japan culturally but then they made him a cop well i you know i think that cops are perceived very culturally different in japan than the way oh they, yeah yeah they don't know. just shoot people every day yeah exactly the, the as far as i'm aware japanese police are like much more respected than american cops are yeah, do you know what's not respected though the tax office so are you familiar with this out you have you seen the screenshot where it's like, um, where like God is from a game where Godzilla's attacking the financial districts, and you have like the little woman at the bottom saying, "That's it, Godzilla, attack the financial districts, make <laughs> the people happy." Have you seen that? I think I've probably seen it at some point. You think it's a, it's a really it. famous shit post, but that's based on a real thing that happened with a uh, one of the Godzilla movies where Godzilla knocks over. A, he's in Tokyo and he knocks over this big building, mm-hmm. and that building is where like. Japan's version of the IRS is, or like right. Alvin, like, you know, H- HMS, you know, HMRSC, where you pay taxes. Mm-hmm. Godzilla knocks it over, and the entire crowd cheered. You know, Carl, we are currently recording this end of financial year. Yep. If Godzilla could come in and just get rid of HMRC right now for me, I think I'd be cheering too. It's like the best joke in Fairly Odd Parents, where like he wishes to not have a job and just the giant Godzilla appears and destroys his office. Like, wow, that was my office. I'm unemployed. <laughs> Let's frolic with the other unemployed people. I love the idea that unemployed people frolic. No, anyone can frolic. Well, well, actually, I was about to say anyone can frolic, but have you seen this thing that like many people were talking about? Of just At some point, men in their life kind of forget just how to skip and by like skip, you know, like, still... joyfully like skip. Yeah, I still do that. It's, there's an entire Michael McIntyre bit about how it's the single most efficient way to travel. But a lot of like older men, because they've not frolicked in so many years, we're not talking like skipping rope. We're talking like you know the the like joyful skipping, yeah, and like, running well, kind well, of. Well, I think yeah. like, just jumping forward, like you know. Yes, exactly, and like just you'll ask like a lot of older men, and they'll just have forgotten. It's like you know, obviously older men, they're not allowed to frolic, Carl. And it's been so many years that they completely lose the muscle memory of like, how oh, the fuck do the mechanics of this work? I still do it. you got to do it every now and again. It's how I get from A to B in my house. It's quicker. <laughs> so yeah, not, not everyone can frolic everyone. Oh, that's the sad moment. It's like when that, that like thing where you get told, like, there's one day your parents put you down and never pick you back up. Mm-hmm. So I don't like thinking about that. Yeah, I don't like thinking of like, Some men, when they're older, have like had such little... It, such little so, allowance to show their enjoyment of life. Just, yeah. That just they've so forgotten how things. to just frolic around. Like they've been like, you know, beaten out of them so much that they just do not have the ability to just completely lose themselves in the moment. Mm-hmm. You're the one of them that fucked me up the most recently. This actually got me. Because like, right. normally those things, they don't get me. One is like just, oh, if you've got siblings, one of your siblings never goes to a funeral. One goes to all of them. One go, one has no one oh. come to theirs, and I'm like, no, don't do that in my head. <laughs> you can't, you can't do that to me. Oh, 
Well, I've got so two hard. brothers and a sister. Yeah. I'm going I'm to outlive all those bastards. Just the idea, yet yeah, one never goes to a funeral and one attends all of them. Yeah, and then one has no one come to theirs. Mm-hmm. That fucked me up when someone said that. I know, I, in my head I knew that was true. You'd have to tell me, though. You'd have to remind me. Thanks, Carl. Like, you, Carl's bringing everyone's day down. I am. Oh, dear, but speaking of bringing people down... Yes. Just the reception of this movie, Carl. It was not great, I imagine. I presume not, no. Um, the history of the 98 film and its monster have been a rather mixed and negative one. Um, I think mixed is the best way to put it. because I got... assume so, yeah. We got all right reviews. Some people, like, it's a fine monster action movie, but the context of it being a Godzilla movie means you've got to judge it as a Godzilla movie. And it's yes. not a good Godzilla movie. Mm-hmm. It is a very bad Godzilla film, specifically. Um, the initial reaction to the 90 year release was mostly a negative one, spanning from both movie critics and the Godzilla fan base alike. Yep. Um, it was critically blasted for uninspired acting, random plots that don't fit, or necessary use of rain. Uh, inconsistent size of the monster, which happens a lot in a lot of monster things. It's very noticeable in that movie, though, because like, Godzilla goes from being bigger than a skyscraper to being at a height behind them. Yeah, yeah. Um, shoddy special effects, even for its time, and the constant themes of actual scenes, it was accused of ripping off from Jurassic Park. It's 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 blatant. It's one-to-one. And the we'll talk my... about that literally in the next paragraph, so we'll get yeah. into it. Um it was accused of heavily borrowing concepts such as the asexual development of eggs. Uh, Multiple scenes had the main characters running for their lives from the baby Godzillas, which would look much like the Velociraptors in Jurassic Park, although the directors instead said this was... insisted, sorry, that it was not intended. Even though they used Um, the same process as well to realise them. Yeah, it says some scenes were virtually frame by frame the same as Jurassic Park. That's what gets me as well, because like when you hear it, you watch it and go... Okay, that's very close. Mm-hmm. If you you can literally overlay one scene over the other, and sure. it is one to one, almost as if they traced over the really cool CGI dinosaurs from Jurassic Park with their own dinosaurs. Like it is one to one. I'll have to look that up because I was like, completely unaware before clicking on this wiki. Like literally, like when they say it is one to one, like they traced over it. God, yeah, it says uh, the Velociraptor shadow scene jump attack scene, all the door opening scenes, all, you know, sorry, the Velociraptors just look almost frame for frame. And that's the thing as well. If they were going to say it's a reference, that's one thing. Because that's the, they could have said, oh, it's a similar scene. We were paying homage to Jurassic Park. You can't pay homage to something that came out last year. Yeah, true. You can't do that, right? You can't pay homage to something that just came out. You're yeah, ripping it off. Jurassic Park's, what, 94? Four, five, ninety-six. Uh, I'll double check. I'll double check. At best, it was a few years old. Ninety-three. Fucking hell! Jurassic Park ninety-three. No. Fucking hell! That still blows my. Why does it look so good? I thought earliest ninety-four. Yeah, that's insane. It's one year younger than me. How oh, does those shit. dinosaurs look so good? It still looks pretty good now. It looks better than CGI today. <laughs> That's the thing everyone always says, and like, it's still true. Mm-hmm. Oh dear. Um, at the end of the film where Godzilla was killed by F-18 Hornets, audiences were confused as to whether or not they should have felt sorry for the creature or cheer, much like the New York citizens and military celebrated Godzilla's demise. Well, that's the one, yeah, they kill it, but Godzilla's like kind of like, not a hero, like, it's a hero in some movies, but Godzilla's like a concept. Mm-hmm. It'd be like having a movie where someone shoots like the metaphysical concepts of like life. Like, yeah, I guess. Like it does say here that you know original movies like Godzilla you're meant to feel sympathetic for because they're essentially a martyr. Yeah. And that's always like Godzilla has always been seen as like a martyr or a protector. And then the Americans are like, nah, big monster, fuck it up, let's celebrate. Shoot it. Yeah. Like, as I said, they cannot conceive of something that they cannot kill with their guns and bombs. Mm-hmm. And they, like the American mind is so small that it can't comprehend something beyond itself. This is a country that's obsessed with God, and they couldn't even make a movie about a creature that has God in its name. Um, 
And yeah, it's like I was just reading ahead there, yeah, of like it's so just ridiculous how badly they treated like Godzilla in general, but yeah, it's the heaviest criticism here is just like the the lack of similarities and personality to the original Godzilla. Yeah, with if it wasn't for the name, you wouldn't know it's Godzilla. There's a no, famous exactly. story about um, when they got that maquette. So that's the name for like, the big models they use, mm -hmm. like uh, the super detail models they use for monsters. The story is that when they took the maquette for Zilla into Toho for approval, it, and it's one of this, I'd love to be a fly on the wall of that meeting, mm -hmm. where the story goes that like. Toho were like, okay, let's see your Godzilla. We've not we've seen like some sketches, let's see it. They took like the 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 top off the maquette to show it. And apparently Toho executives just sat there in silence for five minutes. <laughs> Asked for the people to leave the room when they came back in, said, Okay, it's fine. And apparently in the five minutes where the people weren't in the room, they said in Japanese, That's not Godzilla. It's too late to change it. The fuck are we gonna do? bollocks to it let it have that we'll just change it later jeez and like but the, what makes it funny is roland emmerich didn't speak japanese so mm -hmm. he took that to mean when they said we have no changes as that's a good thing when in reality it was it's so bad but we can't do like a ground up rework it's cause irredeemable the, at this point it's yeah. irredeemable fuck it put it out to cinemas i guess i guess it's, it's so bad we can't fix it we've got to deal with it <laughs> it's just the idea that they just Send the Americans back home and just right. Like, I guess we're gonna have to start making our own Godzilla project. Uh, I literally think that's like within like the week they started the plans <laughs> to make the Millennium one because they knew it was gonna bomb. Yeah, it was just like they knew. Well, shit. We're just gonna, the fact, this can't be the like, the end of Godzilla. Just the fact though that just taking it off and then five minutes of silence. That's like that must have been awkward. They were just taking in its awe, its presence, Carl. Yeah. And we have so many chats talking about why the CGI looks good. Like This is a thing people maybe... I feel it's already well known, but yes, we're aware that it's not just that CGI, it is CGI com in tandem with practical effects, which we discussed in the T-1000 Wiki Weekends episode. Mm -hmm. We go into more detail about that there. We're, we're keenly aware. We're both fans of like you know the genre of film and like you know, the behind-the-scenes making of stuff like that. Hey, yeah, yeah. And we, we love watching... like documentaries on how things yeah. were made and stuff like that. It's, uh, well, people always tell, they always say that's as if you, it's like, we're aware. Well, you know, it's just, it's, it's the, the done thing online to talk about how good the CGI, because the CGI still looks good. Even yeah. taking into account that like, it's like used in tandem with practical effects, that CGI, like that T-Rex in the rain, that's the dinosaur. That's dinosaur. <laughs> it's a real good looking one. And um, yeah, there's many things that they talk about here, just like, you know, it was, previously like called king of the monsters but this one reproduced asexually and laid eggs and yeah. like it I didn't have like power breath strength or durability it was killed really easily and for many reasons such as these fans refused to equal the two monsters and differentiate it by giving the creature nicknames such as not zilla trizilla dean zilla or pat zilla because of its creators dean devlin and patrick uh yep. tatapoulos and or then gino is the other one uh, and then, yeah, um, the other one here is Gino, spelled G dot I dot N dot O. Which stands um, for? It is an acronym for Godzilla in name only. Yeah. And later, when they canonized that creature, it became known as Zilla. And they, when they asked Toho for an explanation of like, why is it called Zilla? Because they took the god out of Godzilla. That's literally god, the next line of the wiki, yes. A god cannot be killed by a bomb. <laughs> so that's like I know, I know this. I mm -hmm. love this film. No, 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 I love talking about this film. Yeah, and I, I think that that might be the just excellent way to end this podcast. They took the god out of Godzilla. Also, as well, the fact that I said it—that's you know, the next line in the wiki. I'm like, <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> Carl is the wiki for this one. I didn't need a wiki for either of these, but. <laughs> Oh, uh, but yeah, it's so I think funny you can see that... it right on the shelf behind me. Do you know what that is? That right there. Like, is that like a Godzilla compendium? That is, because I like buying like shit art books. That is the tw the the making of of the 2014 Godzilla movie. And the reason I love that is because you think, what would be the thing you want to look in an art book about a 2014 Godzilla movie? What's like, what do you want to know about? 
And I, the answer would be Godzilla, but I'm guessing that half of that art book is like, here's what Brian Cranston's suit is going to look like. There is literally a section on the casting, and like it's about Brian Cranston. There's more. Brian Cranston has more pages dedicated to him than Godzilla does. <laughs> oh, dear. And the reason I own it is because it costs a tenner. And you're the one that I'm saving up for next. I'm not saving up for it because I'm not going to pay money for it, but mm-hmm. I know it exists and I want it. But it's like right. 40 quid at the moment. Mm-hmm. And it is the making of the Flash movie. Oh, God. Which I saw in Waterstones for 30 quid. I went, that's going to go on sale. That's going to want... that's gonna go on sale faster than the Flash. Yeah, and I want to have that because I just want to do, you know, having your Frank and Babe sock next to the like, making of the Flash movie. I still remember for the longest time one of like my um kind of pieces of pride on my bookshelf it was a Sonic Generations guidebook. And That's it was amazing. from it was from when like um Game Station or Game were about to close down and it cost Dude. one P. It cost one penny for the entire like massive compendium guide of Sonic Generations. And I left that sticker on just proud You've on the shelf. You've got to do it. You've got to leave one that cost one pence. The yeah. one pence. That's what I collect like art books like that. So I collect good ones for like things that I enjoy, but also the 2014 Godzilla movie because it's 90% not Godzilla. Mm-hmm. Save that I want to get that Flash one, but it's, being 30 quid, I'm not paying that, but that'll go on sale. I can't that'll wait go on sale so fast. The details of how they brought like people back from the dead to be put in that trash ass movie. That's what I want to know. Cause there's got to be something in there about that, right? Mm hmm. And I want to know how they frame it for the thing they use to advertise the product. Yeah. So you might be thinking, why would you want to own that? I want to own it because I want to know. And also, it's just really funny. It's really funny to have that as well. Because the fact that they thought this is going to be such a bit, the point of a stand. So, like, it's going to be such a big hit. People are going to want to know about the making of this movie. <laughs> it's like, no, I just want to know how much Ezra Miller's mentioned in this. Oh, God. I want to look at when this was written and see how much they get mentioned as the main character of your <laughs> film. Oh dear. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed the Zilla versus Peter Jackson's King Kong podcast. I love that the both of their that... minds just went to like what are the just like mid you know nineties two thousands like the maybe not the greatest versions of these films. Here's the thing as well, like you know that Godzilla in like your movie was like hundred feet tall. Mm. Do you reckon like the King Kong from? 2005 King Kong could have beat it despite only being like 25 feet tall. It got killed reckon... by a missile, Carl. Yeah, I reckon that King Kong, despite being a quarter of a size, would have probably stood a fucking chance. Probably. Right? At the very least, it could have just picked up the babies and started throwing them at Zilla. Yeah, I remember like hearing this of like a, a review of like that King Kong movie. Is like I reckon like Andre the Giant has stand a chance against that King Kong. <laughs> Like, he'd probably die, but I reckon he'd probably be, give it a good go. Oh, right? get, get a suplex in on that Zilla. He'd probably give it a good go. Man. Yeah, I love just the fact that our minds just jump to the same places. What's well, It's the fun stuff, right? That, that's what I figured is, like, this has probably got a lot more interesting things in the wiki to talk about than, like, well, the 2014 movie Godzilla wasn't really there, but it was an alright film. And that's it. the production for that's like more disappointing than anything. Of hey, mm-hmm. we had Brian Cranston, and what do you do with him? It's like we had Walter White versus like Godzilla. What do we do? We killed like Walter White in the first five minutes, and Godzilla's not in it. Yeah, and we made like Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch make out for a while. Yeah, that was weird. Do you ever hear that like interview with those two, where they asked them like, "We're doing they're going to be like Age of Ultron," mm-hmm. because like clearly they didn't know who the fuck like like Pietro and wrote like um, Natasha were. It's not Natasha, is it? It's um, no, Scarlet Wonder. Witch is. Wonder. They're, they clearly had no fucking... They knew they'd been cast, but they didn't know who they were in the comics. Mm-hmm. Like, a random interviewer brought up like... You know in the comics, like, they're brother and sister, right? Like, yeah, we know that. It's like, do you know in one comic they just start kissing? Because in the comics, like, Wanda and Pietro, like, have a weird incestuous relationship. Right. And I think, I'm pretty sure, like, Elizabeth Olsen started talking about how, oh yeah, we channeled the energy from Godzilla into that performance. It's like, no, you didn't. Wait, no, that was. Too... I'm trying. Yeah, I can't remember which way around those movies came out, but yeah, around the same time. But it was around the same... same time. Yeah, she claimed that they did that. It's like, no, you fucking didn't. No, 
No, you didn't, but they got caught out in a thing of like they didn't want to admit they'd not read the comics. You know, like it's not but you can say it's I've not, not read that the comic. Bigger deal. Yeah. But it that is the proof that they hadn't, because clearly they just got caught and went, No, no, we channeled that into our performance. So like, you know, we played a husband <laughs> and wife of the previous film. We know that they like there's say like, you watch that movie, they have almost no chemistry. Yeah, zero, yeah. But oh dear. I uh I have had fun. That's a story for another day, though. It's a fun one, too. Some of the years things have been, but yeah, I genuinely think that it would be a fun thing for like people listening to go revisit both of these films in some sense and just look up those because I think they've probably both got tarred with like a worse brush than they deserve, but they're still both not great movies. But definitely interesting to see like how they hold up to their reputations. The Peter Jackson one holds up, I think. He should weirdly enough, there should have been a director's cut that was shorter. Because mm-hmm. the problem with like the the Peter Jackson one is you know what King Kong is. So you don't need that like literal hour mm. of the preamble of them going to like Jack Black wandering around New York. It's like just get to the fucking gorilla. Yeah. Yeah. Like and it's weird to think like I want a director's cut that's shorter. I want a director's cut where Peter Jackson's like, okay, let's put more gorilla in. It's it's like that I contend that Yes, there is a couple of elements from the extended versions of Lord of the Rings that would have been nice context for the theatrical release. I think sitting down and watching them, especially as a whole trilogy in one go, like the theatrical releases are just better for the yeah. for the layman, for most people. Yeah. I have like a um, a litmus test for whether or not I should listen to someone's opinion on movies, and if they say I wish Tom Bombadil. Was in the Lord of the Rings, but it's like I just stop listening. <laughs> I don't need to get like Tom Bombadil would have fucking ruined those movies. Mm-hmm. And when they say, oh, "I wish Tom Bombadil was in there," no, you don't. No one wants Tom Bombadil in those movies except for weirdo book fans, and it would have ruined the movie. Mm-hmm. And like you know, every time Tom Bombadil showed up in the Hobbit movies, I just didn't care. Not not, not to mention, I didn't care about those movies in general yeah. because they were bad, but. Like Tom Bombadil didn't add anything to those either. No, and it's a thing. For, it was a thing for exclusive for fans and people who aren't fans of. So I even know Tom Bombadil. So I'm like, okay, that's Tom Bombadil. Mm-hmm. But like people who don't know, it, it's like the fuck is this? Why is he here? Also, who's this dude? Like the rabbit carriage with sh- literal shit on his face <laughs> in every scene. He had like he had like yep. shit he had on like his shit face, in right? His hair and everything, yeah. It's like, why is he here? It's like because he's in the novels, and people complain if he's not. Mm-hmm. People like fans all complain that this this character's not in it. It's like, but anyway, anyway, this is a rabbit hole. Yeah, unintended rabbit hole. Continue going down, but we will not. We will end this like nigh on two hour podcast here. And um... two thirds, two thirds of the King Kong movie. God, yeah. I mean, so maybe, it, maybe to, the, yeah. the King Kong movie should have been about as long as this podcast. That's what, if you're listening to this now, you think, man, this has been a long podcast thing. If you're watching like King Kong in the theatres, there's another hour left yet. You're Over not even watching. He's not, he's not even in New York yet. <laughs> he's not even in New York. In the 2014 Godzilla film, you probably haven't seen Godzilla yet. You've seen. I don't know. What, like, I don't know. We've talked about. Zilla longer. We talked about Peter Jackson more, like Peter Jackson in this podcast more than Godzilla was in the 2014 Godzilla one. Mm-hmm. But oh, uh, been a very fun one. I just do the usual, though, you know, like subscribe. I guess comment and let us know like which movie would just benefit from being shorter rather than longer. Like the director's cut of just get an editor in on that fucking director. Yeah, just I, I contend that yeah, the Lord of the Rings movies could absolutely do with having the machete cut treatment, which mm. is the version of like the Star Wars prequel trilogy where someone just edited them down to be one movie. I think you could do that a lot of rings. Yeah. Oh, but anyway, thank you all for listening. I hope everyone has a lovely day. And Carl, thank you for joining me once again on another great episode. No problem. Right, cheers everyone for tuning in. Let us know which wiki won this week.